Good. So I think we're, we're ready to go. So where we are, Peace of Health. Morning. Welcome to everybody for the uh, uh, Welsh Ambulance University Trust Board meeting. Welcome to those people joining us remotely. Um, we are four eight. We welcome Jane, our new non executive director. So very warm welcome to you. Uh, we welcome Fleur, who's joining us remotely, observed from the Welsh Government. Good morning to you. Bethan, who I think one of our non executive directors, is also joining us remotely. I don't know, Bethan, can you hear us? Are you there? Yes, okay, well, we'll hope she'll, she'll join us soon. And we also welcome to, to Angela from Slice. And what we're going to do, because Angela doesn't know everybody, although many of us know her, is we will just go around the, uh, the table to introduce ourselves. And um, by arrangement, Angela's going to go first. So Thank over you. to you. Thank you, Claire. Nice warm welcome. So I'm Angela Muthill. I'm the Director of Operations in Place. So I'm here today to represent the patient for us. Thank you very much. Okay. Shall we go around with Angela? Do you want to go next? Can you come around that way? I'm Angela Lewis, Director of Corporate Governance. Nice to meet you. Hi, Angela. I'm Trish Mills. I'm the Director of Corporate Governance and the Board Secretary. Hello, Angela. We've met before. Colin Dennis, the Chair of the Board. We've met as well, but good to have you with us here. Jason Kellen's the Chief Executive. Thank you. Hi, I'm Chris Turley, Director of Finance. Hi, Angela. Peter Curran, non exec board member. Morning, uh, Damon Turner, trade union partner. Hi, Angela, we know each other. It's the Style Director of Partnerships and Engagement. Morning, Johnny Samu, Director of Digital Services. Morning, Hannah Rowan, non exec director. Morning, Andy Swimmer, non exec director of Paradise. Uh, I am Liam from uh, Director of Quality and Nursing, and I've got Leanne in my team, who I know works very closely. Morning, Jane Beasley, non exec. Hello, I'm Lee Brooks, the Director of Operations. Jamal, Director of Strategy Planning and Performance. Morning, Kerry Jackson, Vice Chair. Hello, Alex Payne, I'm the Good Governance Team. Oh, well, we have a couple on the screen. So, Hugh, do you want to say hello? Good morning, Angela. I'm Hugh Parry, Trade Union Partner. And Bethan, do you say hello? Good morning, all. Apologies, I can't be with you in person. I'm Bethan. I'm one of the non exec directors and chair of quality and patient safety committee. Good, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, the usual reminder that uh, we are being recorded, quite sensitive microphones and so on, so be aware of that. And also, just um, as always, for any external um, viewers, people who are watching you now, people who watch you later, a reminder that the Trust Board is the end of the governance process. It's not the governance process on its own rights, but much of the governance process takes place in all of the various committees which have been meeting diligently doing the forensic scrutiny and assurance work before this meeting. So this meeting is not here to rehearse and repeat those things, but it is to hear from those committees, which we do both during the meeting and separately, specifically towards the end. Okay, with that said, we can move on through the agenda. First item, declarations of interest. Does anybody have any declarations of interest relating to this meeting? No. Very good, thank you very much. The next item three, we have two sets of minutes that we just need to approve. The first was the meeting of the 12th of July, which we held to approve the accounts and the duty of quality report. The other meeting was the 25th of July, which was our standard board meeting. Everybody content to approve those minutes? There we are, very good, thank you very much. Those were approved. Under item four, the action log matters arising. There was only one matter arising, which was relating to the patient story last time we heard and Liam anybody wanted to say anything about that but I know the matter is closed uh no I don't think I need to say anything no. else okay that's fine that, that matter is closed so we can move straight on then to item number six uh five. no item number five my apologies the chair's report there's a written report as normal which um sets out my activities during the month we have decided it'll be good practice to include in future written reports the vice chair's activities as well but on this occasion, I think we're just going to take a brief summary, Kerry, from your good self as to vice chair activities during the month. Thank you, Chair. So um, I just wanted to update on the vice chair peer group. Um, so I joined that when I became interim vice chair at the end of last year. And the last meeting in September was hosted at um, VPH. And that gave vice chairs the opportunity to visit various teams, including the ODU, 111, EMS. I think it was a really good opportunity for raising awareness of the challenges that, you know, our teams face. And we had really positive feedback. So um, I thought it was a really productive visit um, and meeting. And Lee joined us to 
update on the clinical response model, um, which I think was really well received. And the chair has invited Lee to come back in December or January. So and I think that follows presentations from Andy and uh, Liam um, on mental health and, you know, our general transformation journey. So um, I think it was a really positive meeting. And some of my colleagues have asked for follow up meetings, vice chairs and also the NHS confed. So that's Good. it from me. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Kerry. The other thing I will just mention in, in this item is that, as, as members know, we have two vacancies now from the exec directors, the academic led and a uh, non-exec director to replace Kevin. Uh, interviews for one of those posts is taking place this week and interviews for the other posts is taking place next week. That's a good response. So I'm optimistic that we will be able to make two appointments to those, those two vacancies. Okay. I'm just checking if anyone any questions. I don't imagine so. Good. Okay. In that case, Bethan. Sorry, Bethan. Your hand was up, Bethan? No. It wasn't up. Misled by the chief executive. <laughs> Fine. Okay. In that case, we'll move on. Item number six is the chief executive. Thank you, Jack Colin. Okay. So uh, the, the uh, extensive report on uh, activities uh, since we last met is before you. I'll just pull out half a dozen or so things as we go through, and of course, happy to take any questions at the end. Um, first one is paragraph four on page three, um, Manchester Arena Inquiry. Um, I think it's just worth noting um, that the uh, uh, business cases, uh, as we've seen before, uh, have now been submitted to commissioners uh, and copied to government as requested. Um, and commissioners are now considering um, uh, those. We expect a scrutiny process uh, of, of the um, business cases that have been submitted uh, to commence in, in the coming weeks. Uh, and Lee, your team has continued work on the uh, <coughs> recommendations, which are within our control anyway. If you want to say perhaps a few words about progress there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jason. Progress is, uh, continues to be very positive against the uh, recommendations. I think if you look at the uh, chart that's set out on page three of Jason's report, um, whilst we do still have some outstanding, there are 20 of those, as the report says, that uh, has a dependency on the case that's now been submitted. So when you start to put them into the completed numbers, actually, it's a, a pretty uh, positive position. The team are continuing to work to try and close those that are remaining with us over the next six months, uh, at which point we might be able to look at where best uh, else and our business as usual arrangements uh, progress can, can continue to be uh, monitored. But nonetheless, our very small team on this have, uh, I hope the board will agree, done a fantastic piece of work to date. Yeah. So, um, next paragraph to pull out is paragraph nine, bottom of page four. And this is um, just uh, to raise awareness of the uh, uh, restructure and reconfiguration in EMS coordination and organisational change process has been underway uh, since July and is expected to conclude this quarter. Um, uh, what that seeks to do, uh, amongst a number of things, is strengthen uh, and add management capacity and depth into our 999 contact centres, which has been lacking for some time. We've invested in that. Uh, we've been able to invest in that this year uh, to both... Um, principally support staff um, uh, in those difficult roles, uh, but also improve our ability uh, to manage, you know, what is a complex and dynamic environment. So I'm pleased that we've got good progress going on there, uh, and that should come to a conclusion at the end of this quarter. Uh, the next one I wanted to draw out, uh, if I can, takes us further into uh, the report, uh, and it's uh, bottom of page 14, paragraph 70. Uh, this is just to congratulate those uh, colleagues uh, from the clinical directorates that were involved in the first ever pre-hospital maternity conference which took, which took place at the beginning of September uh, in Birmingham. There was over 350 people from across the UK uh, and led uh, by two of our people, yeah, largely led uh, by, by uh, two of our people, um, <coughs> uh, our midwife uh, and one of Andy's team, uh, one of our consultant paramedics. And so that was really good to see uh, us taking a lead in that uh, uh, event across the UK, uh, first one of its kind. Um, and indeed, we were, um, I think, recognised again this week uh, within the last couple of days uh, for the work that uh, we've been doing on maternity by the Academy uh, in terms of MPDS uh, and the work uh, around Protocol 24. Um, see too. Uh, page 18, top of their paragraph 87, uh, uh, we've launched 
uh, the digital plan, uh, supported by a video from Johnny, uh, which has gone out, which is great to see. We had some good engagement and interaction uh, with that uh, already. So we'll be talking more about that in the roadshows coming up uh, next month now in a couple of weeks time. Uh, so that's good to see that uh, off. Uh, often out uh, in the organisation. And then the final two, uh, paragraph 106 talks about MPOX preparedness. Um, Liam may want to say a few words about this, but um, uh, clearly there's been some work going on behind the scenes to ensure we're ready to be able to manage any cases of MPOX should they eventuate here in the UK and indeed in Wales. Um, we'll bring an assurance paper through Quest and then through to board in due course. Um, but you might just want to say a few kind of highlights now for the board. Yeah, so uh, as uh, colleagues might uh, recognise, we would already have plans in place to deal with any significant communicable disease outbreak. Uh, those plans have been reviewed in light of the World Health Organisation and the UK-wide advice uh, on the two forms of MPOX that are uh, prevalent globally and the one form of uh, MPOX that is uh, prevalent in the UK. Uh, all actions that you would expect to take in in terms of look, in, including looking at training uh, and competency and issue of equipment have been completed uh, or are being completed. There's some gaps that we're just closing off. Uh, and as a trust, we made a strategic decision a little while ago to uh, enhance the level of respiratory protective equipment available to our frontline EMS crews. Uh, and that work is also ongoing to complete rollout in the next few weeks. Great. Thanks, Liam. So there'll be a paper in due course, Chair, coming through to bottom insurance. Uh, paper coming through in due course. And then the final paragraph, just to pull out, top of page 23, paragraph 140. <clears throat> Great to see uh, that we've been uh, listed as finalists in three patient experience network awards, national awards across the UK, uh, for the work that our teams have been doing uh, around partnership working to improve the experience, innovation, innovative use of technology, uh, and engaging and championing the public. So that's great to see. And I'll stop there if you have any questions. Okay, thanks very much, Jason. So uh, questions to Jason. Um, thank you, Jason. Great report, as, as always. Um, and I think it, you know, just shows a lot of the progress and achievement. So I uh, really welcome that. I had a question on the overall strategic level of collaboration across health boards. So when you read the report, collaboration and partnership is really evident. But, you know, at exec level, um, I suppose a bit curious about how that's going, because it very much feels to me it's quite a critical dependency in terms of the journey that we're on. Yeah, I mean, there's probably a couple of things to say, Rachel. You might want to comment about, yeah. you know, the engagement that your team has from a planning perspective, um, you know, with health boards at a yeah. local level. Um, but I, I think I'll just give two examples, Kerry, of the kind of exec level uh, engagement we have with, with the system, or well, three actually. Um, so I think the first thing to say is that, that all of our team, uh, our, our directors are part of the national peer groups. Uh, so, so we'll be in those peer group discussions uh, with their colleagues from health boards and indeed the other um, trusts across Wales. Uh, recently, we had a, 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 a exec to exec uh, discussion, strategic discussion with DHCW, just by way of an example, uh, which has led to you know a, a couple of really exciting actually opportunities for us to follow up uh, with them. Um, and that's just one example of, of kind of the engagement we've got going on. And then more recently, uh, Rachel and I, you were up in, uh, we, we were up in uh, BC on Monday, weren't we? Um, this week, uh, meeting with Carol. Uh, we we're on our second round of, of, of engagement discussions with the chief executives about um, what we've got going on and how we can uh, more locally support their plans. Um, uh, uh, so, yeah, I think there's good dialogue and engagement at a strategic level. And perhaps I you might want to talk about kind of operational level with, with the planning team. Yeah, and I mean, just to add to that strategic level, obviously through the commissioning arrangements, we kind of, um, we, were, we were interested actually to note at the last JCC meeting, uh, which was last week, quite a large proportion of the agenda still centres around our service, which is one of the risks we were worried about in terms of us being a smaller part of a, of a larger commissioning organisation but actually uh, you know our work featured in a number of the gender items uh, throughout the uh, throughout the morning so that was that was positive I mean from a local level um, we've got uh, from a commissioning perspective we've got the uh, what used to be called the ICAP meetings they're being re revised in terms of the, but they, they will be forums where the commissioners 
from a JCC perspective and the health boards come together with our local teams to discuss local priorities. Um, and we sit on most of their six goals programs in, in some format or another. Uh, and that's not just my team, that'll be the operations leads in, in the local areas, it'll be the clinical leads in the local areas. So we've got quite a lot of forums where we where we come together with health boards and um, we're trying to, we're coming to our next um, strategic transformation board is a proposal to try and uh, bring that together into a bit more of a relationship <coughs> management approach. So we've got a kind of sense of, you know, pulling together all the strings in a local patch so we're all talking about the same things and we're all clear about the messages um so we're going to try and strengthen what's already there but but yeah i think there's a huge amount uh, and just on the i suppose just add on the clinical model transformation work uh, which we touched on with the um jcc uh, committee uh, last week Following from that, we think possibly there'll be some further engagement with chief execs. They were very interested in that and they're quite keen, I think, to have outside of the formal JCC meetings, some further briefings with us uh, on that. So quite a lot going on, yeah. I think. That's a really helpful yeah. summary. Thank you. Good. Looking around the table, any other questions for Alan? Any remote I was going to ask one, Jason, about the, um, the 111 call handlers and the position that it looks as though from the paper that you're you're using the 111 call handlers to help support um, clinical support to the green category of 999 callers, which is really interesting because it talks about how those two call centres are beginning to work more and more together. And I wonder whether you could just say a bit more about that. Sure. So this is paragraph 11, mm. um, the CPSS mm. uh, use on green calls. So I don't know, Liam or Lee, you might want to comment on what we're doing and what, it, what the tests of change are telling us from that. Yeah, so I'll start sliding. All right. Um, so thanks, uh, thanks, Chair, for drawing out actually some fantastic work mm. that is happening um, as we are uh, exploring the best the, or the, the full benefits, I think, of the new system that's been uh, deployed in 111. So there are, as you've uh, mentioned, a, a couple of trials, a pilots that have been undertaken. Um, the one that you mentioned uh, has been very interesting because already there is green activity that originates via 999 that goes to 111 at the moment directly to clinicians uh, for uh, management. So there's not actually a change in terms of the flow of that activity, but what we have tested is how the 111 upfront non-clinical call handling system could potentially better meet the needs of some of those patients. And what we've seen from that uh, pilot is that there is an opportunity <coughs> to meet needs of patients uh, through the system, which actually therefore creates a benefit with additional clinical capacity if we can use the system and non-clinicians to uh, safely resolve uh, contacts with um, uh, from members of the public. So some great um, green shoots, I would describe them as, are coming from these uh, short tests, uh, which are continuing now as we uh, move in towards winter on slightly longer tests uh, to just continue to gain the evidence for uh, supporting decision-making. This is really interesting. Interesting, isn't it? Because it means, if I'm rightly, and for the benefit of people watching, the green the green calls are the lowest security calls, aren't they? Yes. And it could be argued that people who ring nine nine nine, who who are who are triaged to be a, a green category, might actually have been better ringing one 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 in the first place. And so, what's happening is that we 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 have the capacity to be able to transfer those calls who originated in the nine 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 call centre back to the ones where we have the ability to offer that more in depth range of clinical yeah. intervention and supervision and advice, which we can't do in the nines, but you can in the ones. So I mean, it's, it just adds to the, the evidence that bringing those two call centres together and having some commonality and interchange is really good for, for patients. Yeah, indeed. And I mean, I, the, the, you know, the, the, the approach that we're taking here is regardless of the entry point that mm. the patient uses to access our service, be that, you know, treble nine, treble one, or the website, you know, yeah. symptom checking on the website, regardless of the entry point, we increasingly become more sophisticated in tailoring a personalised response to that patient um, through the services that we have, regardless of the entry point uh, that come that they choose to yeah. come to us. That's very good. Yeah, just uh, probably the only bit I would chip in uh, on top of that then is um, just reinforcing we're in pilot phasing uh, and there's a lot of testing and learning and there's a lot of evidential gathering going on as these described, uh, probably to give uh, wider assurance the evidence that we gain 
uh, we do our own internal assessments of, and you, as you would expect, work out whether things are, are working as we hoped and intended. But we also engage with external partners to ensure that we're getting some external scrutiny and uh, review of that work that we are doing. So in part, that's being done through an international uh, exercise in clinical review. And in part, it's in the work we do with Priority Solutions as our commercial partner for uh, MPDS so, and ECMS. So it's, it's just ensuring that, you know, as we discuss this, we're giving assurance we're not marking our own homework. There's a very clear external review that is taking place of what we're doing. Good. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions? We can cross to Catherine. No, we're content. Fine, thank you very much. Thanks, thank thanks Jason. We'll, we'll move on. Um, item number seven, um, question from the public. Do you want me to come in, Chair? Yeah, yes. Uh, well, I'm delighted to say, or not delighted to say, we don't have any questions from the public this morning. But I'm sincerely hoping that's because tomorrow we have our annual general, general meeting. Um, so hopefully our, our colleagues out there in the ether and watching us uh, on the live stream are uh, building up their questions for tomorrow morning. Uh, so for those of you who may have friends, family, neighbours, or again, those watching us who want to join us tomorrow, if you check out our social media um, streams and our website you'll find details of how to join join us tomorrow and uh, lodge your question then at the AGM chair. Thank you very much Christelle, thank you. Okay at this point normally we would ha um, have a star story um, but it's convenient connecting with the AGM we've decided to defer that till tomorrow we're going to hear from um, some of our staff particularly in, in connection with palliative care and mental health so again um, to repeat a sales message, do join us tomorrow for the for the AGM at 9.30 tomorrow morning. So we move on then to item number eight, which is back with you, Jason. It's a slightly revised version of our um, actions mitigation harm. Thank you. Uh, so this is the uh, first revised, as you say, Chair, um, uh, paper on uh, action to mitigate avoidable harm for the ball. Just to uh, remind colleagues and for the benefit of those which have joined us fresh today, um, uh, the board has been receiving a report uh, on uh, these actions to avoid, uh, avoid or manage and mitigate avoidable harm uh, since the middle of 2022. Um, and we took the opportunity um, uh, in the last couple of months to refresh that. And this, this is that first version. So what we've got before us today essentially is a dashboard uh, which supports uh, this brief paper. Uh, that dashboard draws out the, uh, let me describe them as input measures or things which affect or can have an impact on harm, avoidable harm for patients. Uh, and what we're proposing to do is we just we track uh, progress uh, against those, uh, and uh, the board takes assurance from from that uh, that uh, work continues. Um, what we're proposing to do is close the previous action plan that supported the previous iteration of this this paper. Uh, on the basis that those outstanding actions continue to be managed in other work streams, such as through the IMTP, uh, where much of uh, where much of the activity mm -hmm. is taking place anyway. So there is some duplication mm -hmm. um, uh, from the IMTP into into that uh, paper. So um, it's before us today, noting that there are five of those proposed new measures uh, which currently are rated red: uh, one around sickness, one around the consult and close ambition, uh, moving uh, to seventeen percent. Um, uh, and then uh, three uh, around capacity lost um, in other parts of the system, two relating to handover and the interface of the emergency department, and then one relating to same-day emergency care capacity. So um, that's the paper, Chair. Uh, happy to take any questions on it. Good, thank you. Thank you very much. Right, so questions to the Jason on that. Um, Yes, please. Just one point. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Jason. Really, really welcome. I, I think you touched on the point I was going to mention about duplication. It's partly getting my head around just to ensure that we don't, uh, A, we monitor these areas in the right place, and B, we don't duplicate them. Are we clear in terms of the accountability and the reporting of this particular dashboard? Is it complementary to others? You know what I mean? Or is it, um, you know, is it self sufficient in its own right in terms of its own? Uh, monitoring, assurance, reporting, and action. So, so it's, I would describe it as complementary to others uh, because it draws on information which we report in other places. Yeah. Um, so, so some of this information uh, in this dashboard is is contained, say, in the MIQPR, which we'll look at later. Mm. Um, but what this does is it brings together the picture of those. Uh, 
headline yeah. measures which impact, you know, directly impact our ability uh, to service patients in a timely fashion. So it's complementary. I think. In terms of governance, then, what of our subcommittees own this? You know what I mean? In terms of where it gets its due scrutiny and attention, is it does it fall under? Does it fall neatly under one of our subcommittees, or is it a board? Uh, a board issue only uh, this this dashboard would be board only right but the, the detail underneath it would be in in quest or in in f and p okay colleagues want to add to that yeah, i'm just going to you know the, the history of this report is that it has been because it's one of our highest risks there's been a report on every board meeting specifically because the board wants to focus yeah. on 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 that particular risk right. um but it has but, but exactly as Jason said, it's it's um, quite a lot of that data is then replicated in the MIQPR, which which has you know it's, it's scrutiny in, uh, for three different committees actually. Yeah. Um, and I was just going to say, I know we had a kind of brief conversation, Kerry, earlier, but I, I think this this dashboard could be tweaked. Kerry had a couple of uh, mm -hmm. thoughts earlier. Um, so this is the first. These yeah. are the indicators that have previously been in that board report, yeah. but actually, I think there's some some thinking to be done around whether they could be tweaked and changed. Um, uh, so, for example, Kerry had a, a good sense of, you know, yes, it's important to know how many people we get to within eight minutes. Mm. The flip side, from a harm perspective, is how many people we don't get to in eight minutes, or how many people wait a longer time. You know, for, so actually, we could tweak some of these indicators to slightly focus in, 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 a, in a slightly different, uh, more pinpointed way. So I think that's it's a good point that Kerry was making earlier. Yeah, yeah, I think I think if I could just come in on that point. So for me, you know, if you look at the dashboard in terms of the top two KPIs, the first one just reports on where. We've got there in eight minutes, but actually as a board, you could argue, well, I would argue that our focus is better spent on where we haven't um, and what can we do about that. So I think having um, that transparency around, you know, the red and amber would be really helpful. And also just on Peter's point, you know, remember when I started and we were elevating through Quest and f and and I can see Beth wants to come in that actually this provided the board with a lot of assurance that because of the level of harm and the challenges that we were mm. facing across the system, that, um, you know, I certainly felt it was important that mm. we had this focus here, despite mm. much more of the longer conversations happening at the committee level. That's right. Beth, and shall we come to you? Thank you, Chair Diolch. Um, Kerry's made the one point, or, or Rachel made the point, um, one of the points I was going to make, which is around, for me, it's the numbers that we don't get to that really give us the picture and the data we are considering. Um, I think this dashboard is a really good step forward. I, I accept that it's work in progress. I think it's useful to show that we are presenting this information differently because we have received it in the same way for two years. As Kerry and, and Rachel have, have said, this started because of the level of, of harm, avoidable harm to people that we were discussing at Quest repeatedly, meeting after meeting, and the Trust Board felt that it needed to be discussed and needed to be visible for all Trust Board members, not just those members sitting at Quest. Um, I, th I think this dashboard is really interesting because when I looked at this, I was thinking, it shows clearly there are ongoing pressure, system pressures. We know that. And there's more work to do um, because avoidable harm is continuing. However, I think what it also does, showing us the two-year average and then the figures for July and August, it shows there have been improvements. So particularly when I look at um, the immediate release directives, you know, if you look at the two-year average and compare with July and August's figures, then there's, there's been an improvement. I guess the other thing that this dashboard doesn't do, but I accept we have this information uh, in a different place, is it doesn't show the differences, the variances across different health board areas across Wales. And as we know, there are significant variances in that respect. So in terms of the so what question, I suppose that part is important for me in terms of what else can we do? How can we continue to work with partners to continue to try and affect even greater improvement? But I, I do welcome this. I think it's very much part of evolving the picture for us. So 
thank you to officers for, for pulling this together. Thank you all. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Bethany. Any other questions? Yes, yes. Yeah, thanks. Um, I was just um, a comment about the, um, the shift overruns. Um, I, you know, taking it to common sense, there's been a lot of effort put into that. I was really grateful for it. Um, just mindful of the fact that it's showing as an amber, although it appears to be stagnant, that would correlate with the red for the patient handover. So just wondering why it would be in an amber category rather than the red. I, I, yeah, I mean, it, it, I think my team look at this and on a long, so it's not just the these two data points here. So the, the um, graph in the MIQPR shows a kind of an overall downward trend. Um, which you don't see in these two data points in this dashboard. So um, that, that's, I think, where the, the AMBER rating comes from. But I do take your point that there's still a lot to do there, isn't there? We, we haven't cracked um, that issue yet in across Wales. Yeah, there's, um, I, I think, I mean, your first point, yes, there's a correlation. Uh, yeah. Yes, I believe there's a correlation yeah. between uh, handovers, um, yeah. lost hours, yeah. and ability to yeah. end shift on time. So I, I agree with that. Um, this this will be an interesting one for us because my presumption is that what we've got here is the pull from CAD data um, because we have and we continue to explore uh, to understand why we see financial data continuing to decline but CAD data stagnant. Now, what we're starting to tease out in that is a compliance to um, hot swap process. So um, we are investigating any uh, overrun longer than two hours in EMS. We've now brought that down to 90 minutes in UCS. So we're starting to bring that back down. And that shows that um, sometimes half of those haven't gone for two hours. It's just been the, the, the process of predominantly hot swap. So we think that we'll uh, have some data correction work that we'll be able to achieve post investigation. Of course, we have to protect the integrity of our CAD data. But if it's been um, the team's currently exploring, if it's been investigated and it's a an, a an error due to the mechanism, particularly of the hot swap, that we might be able to make a correction within the CAD data. So we might then start to see something that's a bit more reflective of reality. But the team are just working through how we can achieve that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the other thing I would just mention is in the pack, there is also another um, document in this um, item, which is the patient harm mitigation sort of spreadsheets. And I think the proposition is that we're going to close that down. Is that correct? Yeah, the proposition is that we, we close, or we cease bringing this action plan yep. here on the basis that those actions which are within our control and continue to remain open <coughs> within other bits of the government structure yep. that we have principally the IMTP work. Indeed, yeah. Good. Okay. So we'll go through the recommendations in a moment. Just checking if anybody else has got any any questions they want to ask on this so, topic. So, sorry, just yes. just to clarify. So the way that this will work going forward is that that scorecard will draw our attention as a board to look at those um, figures specifically through an avoiding patient harm lens, but at, but they will all be examined in other places as well. I wonder, and I'll very happy to take others advice on this if um, we want somewhere just to have a breakdown of where those things are monitored so just that we've got a, a sort of something that concords with it to show that while we are having it presented to us because it's an area of particular concern and for us to have that overview just so that we've got a clear um, map that shows where else those are being discussed in depth because I think that's what we lose by not having the accompanying kind of narrative. Though I'm again supportive of us uh, moving away from that. I mean, I, I think I think that's fair. I mean, one of the things we could do um, is reference in the covering paper for, to the dashboard. Um, you know, the discussions that have taken place in the other committees around the measures which appear in the dashboard. We could do that. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Good yeah. Thank you, yeah. thank yeah. you, Hannah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. That might be an action point takeaway. So in that case, um, in terms of what we've been asked to do, we know the continuing level of avoidable harm. We agree the new um, dashboard that we've been talking about. We note the progress has been made. We agree that the action plan we've just been talking about um, will be closed. And we've had an opportunity to take questions. So if everyone's content, we can move on, I think. I think, Colin, yeah. if I could just say, I think what we've talked about is some changes to the dashboard. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, so yeah. we're not approving what we've seen, but with 
is going to be revised and come back, isn't okay. it? I yeah. assume. Yeah. 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 No, I, I, I expect Colin will go through a couple of iterations yeah. of this in the next yeah. few meetings to get it exactly right. Um, yeah. So I would see, I would expect us to see a revised version yeah. on the next no, occasion. Yeah. I, I think to be accurate, what we're doing is we're, we're approving the move to this yeah. kind of a dashboard, yeah. with the understanding that yeah. it that it will be evolving over time. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks, Thanks so much. Good Okay, I do have a nine. Then um, to you, Rachel, to the um, UPR. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so um, just to note uh, for anybody watching that the MIQPR, as you said earlier, Colin, goes to all of the committees um, and they have a responsibility for particular indicators within this, um, this report that they focus on in some detail. Um, so this is the kind of the final endpoint for the, for the, for the paper uh, at board. Uh, a couple of things just to uh, just to mention uh, in advance. The first is that um, you know, we we are being told that the new um, cabinet secretary uh, and the first minister remain focused on delivery of performance uh, within the health <coughs> service. I think that's just. I mean, it's good to see we, we would want health, uh, uh, you know, the world government to be focused in that way. Um, so it remains important that you know, we as a board continue to focus in the same in the same way. Second thing I just wanted to draw out, which is in the paper, is just to note uh, the areas where we've got some issues with data quality at the moment. Um, so we've pulled out three areas. Uh, there are some ongoing um, data definition issues more in the 111 space. So you'll see in the report we haven't got data kind of right up to date with some of those 111 indicators uh, and work is is concluding a page uh, to get that uh, corrected uh, or, or agreed rather the definitions um, and the second bit is the uh, clinical some of the clinical indicators the quality indicators uh, and I think uh, Liam you've already uh, referred to this within the quest uh, committee uh, and there's a, a plan of work underway which will come back to quest uh, to confirm uh, what, what is being done in, in that regard and the third one is around our APP data um, and that is that is an issue that has arisen um, because we have quite a manual way of recording who's an APP and and then relating that to the activity data. Uh, so Johnny's team um, are working on that at pace at the moment as well to make sure that we get that, that data correct as well. So the, the data is still in there, sorry, BP data, but just to note that it doesn't, <coughs> that there are some um, issues in terms of data quality which we're working on. So having said all of that, um, just to pull out, um, obviously we've, we've um, touched on some of the EMS um, data items in that last paper um, but in terms of 111 I did want to pull out because uh, it's been a concern uh, the call abandonment rate uh, so people uh, colleagues will remember that as we went live with the new system that our call abandonment rate increased um, considerably and there was a concern from commissioners uh, and from ourselves obviously but as we as we had originally identified that is coming back down, both as staff become familiar with the system, but also as we're back on track with recruiting uh, additional call handlers into the into the team um, who, who were then able to, to answer that call in a timely fashion. So that is as predicted, um, and it's good to be able to assure commissioners as well um, of that trajectory. <clears throat> so that's, that's a, um, a good news story. The other one I was just going to pull out was the um, uh, stat and manned. Uh, our, our target is to get it to 85%. Um, and it, it doesn't, it's not quite there, it's 84 point something percent. But to be fair, it's been a trajectory of improvement. Uh, and I think, you know, thanks go to colleagues and managers across the organisation who've, who've really supported uh, the increase there. Um, so, other than that, uh, Chair, uh, as I say, it's been through the, the various committees um, and happy to take any questions on any other detail. Okay, Jason. Thank you. Uh, I've just got three things to pull out if I can. Um, uh, and perhaps I'll ask um, a couple of colleagues just to comment on these. So, um, uh, slide or page six, red performance indicators, the bottom left hand graph, which talks about the correlation or shows the correlation between lost hours and red medium performance. Just perhaps worth drawing out, Lee, uh, and you might want to say something about this, that you know, we have seen some reduction in lost hours through, through the summer. And what we can see there is a directly correlating improvement, albeit we're still off, but improvement in the red medium performance as a result of that. 
may just be worth saying a few more words on that. Yeah, um, thank you. I mean, quite right. Um, those of us that are, are in receipt of the lost hours will know that in recent weeks, we've had a period where there's been some improvement. Um, it's, it still remains high. Uh, I don't want to... I don't want to mislead that the, the quantum still remains high. However, uh, it has been down. And um, again, as, as Jason said, the chart absolutely draws out the correlation, uh, direct correlation between capacity lost uh, and our ability to respond in a timely way. So it has been pleasing um, to have had uh, that occur. Um, we, we wait to see if it shall be sustained. Thanks, um, second one, Chair, if I can, was on bundle compliance. So, Andy, you might want to say something about this. Uh, this is slide nine. Uh, and colleagues will remember we've had some challenges with bundle compliance, particularly as we uh, introduced EPCR you know, over, the last, uh, over the last couple of years. But what you can see here coming through is, is improving compliance um, on the STEMI uh, bundle and also on the stroke bundle. Are Andy, if you want to add anything to that? Uh, yeah, uh, welcome. Thanks, Jason. Uh, yes, you can see uh, we in, initiated the plan around March, April time of this year. And, and if you look at the bundle compliance across most of, of the clinical indicator bundles, we see that trend line going up uh, uh, significantly, some significant, very significant in some areas like necophema and stroke, where you've got that continued improvement. Obviously, there's uh, a couple of others that are maybe still lagging behind, and we are off the, the intended target, but it's pleased to see that starting to bear fruit. Uh, we've got the uh, roadshow coming up uh, next month, uh, where we'll have another push again with an, some more uh, uh, steps within the plan uh, to move us forward. So it, it's pleasing to see that continued rise. And also, if I just draw attention uh, to us, uh, uh, ROSC outcome as well for August, which is 24.2, which is one of the highest uh, we've ever had. Uh, in terms of that output. So definitely positive progress, still way to go, but positive progress in the right direction. Thanks, Andy. And then the final one, Colin, if I can, was on uh, slide 22, which was just to the previous conversation about overruns. Um, um, so, David, this might be helpful for you. Um, uh, uh, with the, except we've still got a long way to go on this, uh, a long way to go for the experience of our people. But what that does start to show is that clear trend of improvement uh, coming through. Uh, in the in the in a reduction in the duration um, of those overruns when they occur. Thanks. Good. Thanks, Jason. So um, over to your questions, Kerry. First one. Um, yeah, just a quick question. Just going back to the red performance and handover delays. So um, when I was um, in the OBU, the operational delivery unit with uh, the vice chairs, there was um, an eighty-four-year-old lady who had been twenty-eight hours. Um, waiting um, and you, you know I, I think it's just really stark isn't it at times when you know obviously a lot of people in this room are living and breathing this but you know occasionally as a non-exec director and a vice chair you know you, you visit somebody and you see that and you hear a little bit about it and I think it's really hard but I, my question was Lee just in terms of your optimism as we're coming into winter on the handover delays so really good you know, there's been some improvements, but just wonder if you had any assurance, I guess, or um, any optimism as we move into winter. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, uh, we what I can, I mean, the reality, the reality is um, we, there was a downward trend through summer. The trend has reversed and it's starting to return. So that does scupper, um, I'm afraid, the level of optimism of the weeks to come, because of course it's likely to become more pressured and stressed in the system. Um, so I, I'm afraid I'm, I'm not particularly optimistic. Um, I, I think holding very much on though, of course, to the winter gone compared to the winter previous, we certainly are, are a long way from the 32,000 hours that were lost in December 22. I have optimism that we are not likely to see that this winter um, because last winter was certainly an improvement, uh, but I'm not, uh, but I, I fear we may have uh, experienced the best the year has for us. Okay, Tony. 
Yeah, thanks, Chair. Just wanted to provide a little bit more assurance on the data quality issue. So the, the team are working on this as a priority at the minute. But just to take that one step further, we're recruiting to some of the data quality roles that we've had vacant for some time. Uh, and we've just recently undergone uh, an audit specifically on uh, data quality. And some of that's going to start to come through the uh, Finance and Performance Committee. And there are few recommendations around the measures so we're going to have a, a bit more of a spotlight on this as we go through uh, in terms of some of the digital measures there uh, so just a few follow-up actions just to provide that additional assurance to colleagues sure thing thanks johnny any other any other questions yes yeah if i can just say that place is about to um, start a four weeks program of engaging with people in ed um and minor injuries units and medical acute units for four weeks starting next week but the patient experience so um, I'll obviously I'd like to touch base with Estelle about that, but obviously I'll bring the feedback to you so you can see, you know, that before you, you talked about a situation there, we're hearing it, um, people's, you know, negative experience about the weights. Um, and I'm happy to share the, the findings of that with you. I think you find it really informative. Well, we will. No, thank you very much. Okay. I think by way of summary, it is perhaps just worth highlighting again. It is, it is amazing, isn't it? I mean, we've, we've been saying for a long time that the red response rates was primarily influenced by handover delays. And the graphical representation here gives absolutely clear confirmation that is right. But as the handover delays during the summer did fortuitously go down a bit, we did see red response go up. And as every step of the delays went down, the red response went up by, by a step. And then again, as it reverses, it reverses. Um, and again, to your point, um, Kerry, I mean, looking at the the figures in the last couple of weeks or so we are seeing that they are going up again so i think we you know we need to be realistic that handover delays are still a significant issue and the direct consequence of that is our inability to respond to a timely timely response to patients in need um, which is fine well not fine but i mean that's it's, it's helpful because it just completely reinforces the argument that we continue to make on that particular point the only other point I was going to make was in terms of one one response time. It's good to see the abandonment rate's gone down. I did notice though, but I don't think it's a bad thing actually, and there might be another positive response to it. I did notice that the it is taking longer to answer calls. But that may well be a function perhaps that the call length is longer, because if people are taking slightly longer one calls, then maybe it takes a bit longer to answer them, if you see what I mean. I don't know whether it's worth reflecting with anybody's got any reflections about, about that. Yeah, I think in the early days of the system um, deployment, yes, Chair, I, I, we, uh, we, we know that the handling time extended, unsurprisingly, with the new system. Handling times now, however, have recovered. Um, it's been, when, when you begin to break down our performance on a weekly basis, we've actually had 5% hit by week uh, when the activity is kind to us. Uh, so it does show for me that it really now is about recovering the establishment, which we know was impacted as a consequence of the lead into the training. So it's, it's good that I think that the signals tell us our staff have uh, transitioned and are used to our system with handling times back to where they were. It really is now the capacity through the establishment and we've got a recovery plan for that heading towards winter. Okay. Good. Okay, if everyone's content, we'll we'll move on to the next item, which Trish, I think it's over to you for risk management for insurance. <clears throat> Thanks, Chair. Um, so you've got the most recent version of the, um, the principal risks here on the BAF. Uh, the Audit Risk and Assurance Committee, the ARAC, uh, looked at these when they met a couple of weeks ago uh, in September. Um, just on the risks 223 and 224, we obviously, that's the focus of the paper that, that we had one um, before, which was the... Um, uh, avoidable harm paper. Um, but I think in addition to that, you'll also see through the Quest highlight report that actually that theme runs right through the agenda. And also just a reminder that we do actually look at these highest rated risks when we're setting agenda as well. So it's not just um, uh, the risk report at the end. And I think on, on 223 and 224, there, there is some work to sort of look at this differently. And there has been a workshop um, with Liam and Lee and, and um, uh, Julie and, and the teams, just to look at how we can split this into what we can manage and what we can monitor. And I think that dashboard in the previous paper, I think is really helpful because actually it lays that out there quite nicely. Uh, and I think that there's been some good work to sort of start categorizing, you know, what, what's external and internal. So that work will continue. So I think that's, that's helpful. Um, we've also got the other uh, four highest rated risks. They've all been reviewed by committees. You'll see their highlight reports 
um, uh, and, and again, in addition to the risks being presented there, um, there are also other papers and assurance around the impact and the other actions as well. Um, and the chairs of, of people and culture and finance and performance may wish to comment on those because they're drawn out in their AAA reports. Um, so I think that uh, the committees were assured that um, the highest rated risks, whilst they haven't changed in score, they are regularly re and robustly reviewed internally as well as some really good scrutiny um, at committees. Um, but there has been some movement. You'll see a de-escalation of risk 424, which is uh, IMTP resource availability, as well as um, a closure of uh, the CAS um, risk as well. So we're seeing some of those that were previously here coming off. Uh, and I think just lastly, Chair, we, we had a spotlight on the risk transformation program at the September ARAC with uh, a presentation on the next steps, which is really the development of a strategic BAF uh, that more closely reflects the risks to our strategic objectives. Uh, and further detail is in the ARAC highlight report that Pete, Peter might want to wish to add something to. But we also talked at ARAC about the risk journey that we've been on. Uh, and with that strategic BAF and the start of the risk appetite conversation, it adds to it. So, so on a range of actions from A to Z, we're in the sort of D to J sort of region at the moment. Um, but there is a lot more to do. There's, you know, digitization, there's revised governance structures. There is a lot to do that's on the program. So just to draw out, this is another couple of years journey, but I think we've set ourselves up really nicely for that journey. Okay, thank you, Trish. Any questions there? Okay. Peter, do you want to come in and... Yep. More of an observation, Chair, actually. Just want to endorse what Trish said in terms of the ARAC uh, meeting we had two weeks ago. I think two issues here. One, we did scrutinise the... The, the, the current risk register and we were certainly happy that it is a living and breathing document and the updates are absolutely appropriate. Um, the, the developments are very, very exciting and I think we'll, we'll come back to that when we discuss the committee, but you know, this issue of differentiating between what we can control and can't, I think we are, we are getting there and, and we'll talk later about you know, the, the better alignment of strategic obje objectives to strategic risks will necessarily draw out those issues that we can control and those that we can't. So we are on a good journey. I'll, I'll come back, if I may, cool. Chair, to that. But just to say, in terms of the current position, we were certainly uh, satisfied as an ARAC that uh, these risks are, are being managed appropriately. Good. Thanks. Thanks so much, Peter. And as you say, you'll, you'll be talking about your committee in more detail further down in the, in the agenda in the normal way. Um, any other questions to, to Trish? Um, so, I mean, just in terms of governance, we were asked to note um, the, uh, the same position as continuing positions of two, 223 and 224, which are the patient harm risks, uh, the reduction in the risk 424, which is the resource risk, the closure of the 619 risk, which is the CAS 111 system, which has now been installed. We've received the assurance that the risks are continually monitored, um, and we note the findings of mitigations and actions. So if we're all content, we will move on to the next item, which is finance, I think. So item number 11, over to you, Chris, I think. Thank you, Jim. Um, just a quick um, <laughs> few items for me to draw out from the paper uh, which you have, which hopefully um, I, I can take as read. Um, as is the kind of general pattern now, this builds on a fairly detailed presentation that I provided to FNP last week, which um, we had quite a conversation at, and I don't know if will come in on the back of that in a sec, um, on, on the year-to-date and forecast um, particularly the revenue position of, of the trust um, continues, as you can see, a, a good delivery of um, balance month on month and forecast year end uh, balance position as well, uh, underpinned by good um, delivery across each of the directorates um, and, and savings delivery, uh, which is obviously good to see. Two things I just wanted to highlight, I guess, the, the capital plan, because um, the focus tends to be on revenue often and um, there's a slightly more detailed update of where we are from the capital plan this year, but um, I'm mindful that there's, there's little yet in terms of the actual delivery against that. And given, you know, we're halfway through the year now, I want to bring that through. So next time there will be more detail of um, and, and to provide further assurance, you know, the words say that we are assured that we have the plan um, to deliver the funding that we've um, secured from government and we have every confidence and good track record of doing that on the bottom line. 
but what I want to bring through next time is um, some update at, at, the, at a bit more granular level of the, of the actuals against that and where there will be inevitably, as always is within a capital plan, some shifts within that bottom line value in, in, in year and there. There's, there's one or two which I'm, I'm aware of that uh, we've seen a little bit of a slippage in one scheme and, and we're going to accelerate some spend that would have been spent next year and another. So I'll, I'll explain that a bit more when we bring that through next time. Um, uh, on the final item is just just on the risks and um, uh, again take it as red, but just to note, I guess the um, I'm not need to go through it in any detail now because we did it at, at FMP and I don't know, but I'm obviously happy to take questions on it. But um, to note, um, building on um, what, what I think we've um, highlighted previously, um, the, the, the status of um, the uh, revanding of technicals <coughs> and where we are with the business case has been submitted to that. The way in which we've reported the risk of that um, cost in year to date, where we've been able to shift that risk a little bit at this time, um, even since writing this and since um, the month five we've met as an executive finance group last week, so that will shift even further um, in, in into month six. Um, with uh, you know the requirement certainly very much so for the recurrent support that we need for that is is pretty much as per the business case and just has as, as we've been able to sort of manage some elements of it ourselves in you but still a residual amount that we need funding for to to continue to, to balance um, to say the, the figures move slightly further from from that um, even at the point of time like this or just over there. Um, but that is still a risk that we will still have to continue to manage and mitigate through the rest of the year um, depending on levels of funding that might be available to us but certainly something that we, we will need to be pushing hard for in terms of recovery support because the costs can't be covered at all on, on, on a recovery basis and, and all the reasons that we you can see in the paper for being able to shift a little bit of that risk downwards this year were and, and non-recurrent and not, not a sustainable position going forward. That was it for me, Chair, and I'll say I'm happy to take questions. Okay. Hey, well, thank you very much. Peter, did you want to? to yes, yeah, so just again, yeah. thanks, Chair, just again to give reassurance. We, we, we um, discussed this at depth last week at at F and P, and certainly we were, you know, very commendable for the finance team and everybody for ensuring that the spend very much equates to budget. So, so that system of you know control clearly is there. I think that's evidence, isn't it, on the table on on page seven? You can see all most of the yellows there. And uh, Chris spoke a lot about the various directorates and the close budgetary control. Um, so, yeah, that, that's very very good. I only have one question that's come out from yesterday, and it's, it's uh, I guess, added to the list of Welsh Government funded activities. The pay award, which I understand now has been agreed at 5.5%. Yep. In terms of the funding of that, uh, are we at any risk that, that we're not going to get that fully funded? Not or? at all. No, it's been reconfirmed further. I was at Finance Directors on Friday. My debt one of my current interim deputies was at the deputy doffs on Tuesday, where both um, I think it was as expected a little bit more level of granular detail at deputy doffs. It was it was confirmed again that um, the the impact of the payroll in, in all its guises is the headline five and a half percent uplift, but there's some nuances within it around um, introducing a, a additional um, pay points into certain bands, etc. As well, all, all of that will be fully funded on actual cost um, in, in in year across the NHS. Okay. Thanks, Jack. Okay, no, good. Again, I'm sure we'll hear more from you, Peter, on that when we come to the uh, the committee um, feedback sessions. Okay, any other questions to uh, to Chris? I think we should commend you, Chris, on uh, you know this is this is a this is a game of many moving parts, isn't it? And you know, trying to keep it all together. Once again, we're heading towards balanced budget. Looks like fingers crossed, which is really good news. And I think also to shine a light on the fact that the, the savings which we've been asked to make again appear to be being made, which again is uh, not an insignificant uh, result, given that it's the or second or third year we've been asked to make significant savings. So uh, I think we should all congratulate the team in, in doing that. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So in terms of finance, what are we asked to do? We're asked to, to note, <coughs> again, assurance in relation to the financial position, the delivery of the savings plans, note the capital programme, and note the month four and five Welsh Government monitoring return submissions have been included within the appendices, which, all of which we do. Great, lovely. Thank you very much. So we'll move on then to item 12, which is back to you, Rachel, the um, integrated medium um, plan. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, so first up, just to pull out the fact that the INTP has been approved. Uh, we had that approval in August uh, with three uh, accountability conditions. There always uh, is always some accountability conditions uh, in, any, in any approval of an INTP, and you'll see those on page two. 
Um, and it was pleasing, actually, to see that one of the accountability conditions is that the Welsh Government are looking for us to continue with the development of our clinical model. So it's pulled out as a very specific ask of us uh, as a result of what we wrote in our MTP. And that, that gives us a lot, of, a lot of coverage, I think, uh, in terms of support. Um, so, that, so that's uh, good to hear. Uh, you're just a, by way of kind of context for the rest of Wales, other organisations, trusts and special health authorities have had approved plans. One health board, I think, has had an approved plan. Uh, the rest are in an annual plan status. Um, so that's that's really positive. The second thing I just wanted to pull out was that you'll see in here we've um, got a lot of detail around the clinical model transformation um, work uh, and a reminder that we kicked off this in earnest in May with a five day set of workshops. Uh, and since that time, we've established nine programmes of work uh, that sit under a new board, which reports into the Strategic Transformation Board. Each of those nine work streams has got a series of you know, uh, other programmes that sit and projects that sit underneath. It's a huge volume of work. Uh, and I've been really impressed by the kind of pace um, and commitment to people across our organisation uh, and commissioners to work with us uh, to take forward uh, a lot of things at pace uh, with some of the uh, uh, priorities then uh, to be implemented pre-winter. Uh, and you can see some of the detail there in terms of uh, the work that's being done. So just a, a, a massive thank you really to colleagues across the organisation, across every directorate uh, who, are, who is making that possible. Um, so that's there if anybody wants to kind of uh, raise any questions um, and just in terms of the engagement on it, it's probably useful to note that uh, a number of us are meeting with Welsh Government colleagues later today after board um, to go through uh, our clinical model transformation work uh, and just to kind of seek their kind of ongoing support uh, for the, some of the detail there. Uh, and uh, uh, Angela might want to note that we've got a, a really full engagement plan uh, that Estelle and team have just, just about finalised now. Uh, where we're looking at how we come out to the public, how we come out to staff uh, and other stakeholders as well. So it'd be really good to work with you, continue working with you on that. Um, the other thing just I'm just going to pull out, Chair, is that we'd, uh, you'll see in here, this is the first time where we are trying to link the actions that we're taking in the IMTP with you know, the measures or the performance measures that we were hoping to um, you know, impact on as a result of the action. So we've kind of got a couple of sections there about turning the dial. If you remember in the IMTP, we had that concept of you know, what, are the, what are the dials we want to be turning as a result of this kind of long-term strategic work that we're doing. I don't think that's quite there yet, but it's, a, it's the first attempt uh, to, to try and link uh, performance and action um, a bit more clearly in this report. Um, and uh, I think that was discussed then at the uh, Finance and Performance Committee, but a bit more work to refine some of that, but a, a good first step. Um, so I think I'll stop there and happy to take any questions. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much, Rachel. So any questions or any comments from anybody? Uh, yes, Karen. Um, a comment and a question. So firstly, congratulations. <laughs> I think, you know, we turn up at these meetings and the IMTP planning and everything that goes on with the clinical transformation model. I know it's a huge amount of work. So mm. um, and great that it's been approved with mm. and the conditions support yes. our direction of travel. So my, my question was, um, and you've reflected on it in your update, is obviously this is a huge amount of work. So I guess from a board perspective, I'm just looking for assurance around the fact that we have the capacity within the organisation to drive this level of change and of course we've had some recruitment going on so um appreciate that helps but just at a higher level you know your confidence that we have that capacity and i suppose resilience particularly heading into winter to drive this at pace it's a really it's a really good question i think um we had a session with our assistant directors and execs a couple of weeks ago and it was one of the issues raised by one of our assistant directors that there's a, there's a lot of work, particularly on the clinical model transformation programme, and there is a concern that some of the, the rest of, you know, some of the other aspects of the rest of the IMTP are fine, are difficult. Are, so we are going to be discussing that at the next strategic transformation board, just to kind of consider that again, um, and, and to make sure we kind of, we're clear with people 
where the priorities are uh, and also to be clear if there are things which we you know acknowledge we might have to slow down a bit uh, in, in order to meet those priorities so I think there is you know there is some stress in the system and across the across the organization as you say we've got some pockets of recruitment areas where we're, we have been able through our um, financial plan to, to invest and to, you know Johnny mentioned one eight, you know health informatics is a massive enabler for some of this program so the fact that we're able oh, and the whole of digital uh, the fact that we're able to make some investment in those areas is going to really help um, but it's a, it's a good question it's one we keep under review constantly thank you okay thank you any other questions I've got a couple of things I just wonder for my own information and perhaps for uh, some, you know, information of other non-executives, there's a couple of uh, jobs which were mentioned here, new, new roles. One is the clinical navigator, and it's, there's a reference about the clinical navigators having been recruited. I just wonder whether somebody could say a few words about what that role actually is and what are the skills you were looking for in a clinical navigator? Because the title clinical navigator doesn't, it doesn't say what it does on the tin, does it really? For me, it doesn't really. Probably Andy, best place to, no, to go. So the process that we have at the moment is, as the call is coded through the uh, call taker, generates an MPDS code and then gets graded as a red, number one, number two, et cetera, et cetera. What we're going to be doing, uh, other than a small number of select codes that will immediately go to red and dispatch, uh, uh, pretty much everything else then will get scrutiny from a senior clinician to determine uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, essentially, which are those ones that we really need to send an ambulance to? Which are the ones that actually need a further assessment? So they'll be doing a very quick scrutiny of these calls as they come in and then separating the calls out. And, uh, probably one of the first places in the country to be doing anything on this kind of scale. Uh, and it'll be a really important role to, to, to get us into the future, be more judicious how we deploy our ambulances so, uh, at that early outset. And where will they come from? What skills? What skill set are you looking for in terms of their previous experience? So we've pretty much on. We've recruited individuals now. We've been through the process. The bulk of them have come from our existing CSD colleagues. So, so they nurses already, or paramedics? Uh, mix of Sorry. the two. Uh, so they've already got significant experience working in this level. But we've also recruited some external as well. So these are really senior clinicians, very good on their decision making abilities. And there's a whole induction program plan for them to go to the next step. Oh, thanks. And the, and the other one, which was the senior advanced paramedic, which I, which I noticed in the paperwork, was against another new role. Because we've got senior paramedics, if I'm understanding rightly, you're concerned with kind of training paramedics, aren't they? Is that, have I got that right? And then uh, this it, is the new role. The, well, it's about the, the clinical supervision and leadership of, of, of our frontline crews. Now, the one gap we've had in terms of that clinical leadership and supervision has been around our advanced paramedics. It was fine when we started, we had a very small number of my team used to do that. As we grow the number, that level of day-to-day -day supervision and, and leadership, uh, the, the need to, to get their practice you know, at, at, at its very best, we've not had. Uh, so we're going through the process now. We've uh, uh, just agreed, actually, uh, uh, with Lee at last week's SLT for, the, uh, for a group of those existing uh, APPs to then take over a role of, as uh, senior APPs mm -hmm. to do that day-to-day -day clinical leadership. Right. So they will come from our existing... They will indeed. Okay. Good, thank you. Good. Yes, thank you. Any other questions from anywhere? Look on the screen. No. Okay. On the agenda, we're due to take a break now. I think we, we might do that. We're slightly ahead of time. Um, it's what more or less 22 11. So shall we have a 15 minute coffee break and re meet back at 5 to 11? Sure. Okay. Thank you. 5 to 11. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for being uh, so, so quick to come back and timely. We are ready to restart. So we are up to item 13 on the agenda, which is the strategic workforce plan. So um, it's an item for approval to approve the plan. And over to you, Angie, I think. Thank you very much, Chair. I'm delighted to be here today with the strategic workforce plan that has been six months in the making. I'm particularly pleased because it was a key requirement of the IMTP, but also of our people and culture plan. Um, a couple of key points I wanted to just reference is to say we shouldn't be viewing this in isolation. And I think Jason earlier talked about um, policies, processes that complement each other. And this most definitely complements those other key documents that I've just mentioned, but many others as well. So um, really keen that uh, colleagues recognise that, but also to bring your attention to the fact that we've deliberately tried to keep this high level, digestible and accessible to a wide audience, which is not an easy thing to do with a strategic workforce plan, because it can often fill people with 
a sense of doom when they think about it. So um, again, when you are, um, I hope having read it and looked at it, you can see that the purpose is around making sure that people can understand what we're trying to achieve. But I do need to give the board the reassurance that behind it is a huge amount of data and evidence and information. Um, just a couple of other key points to make before we open it up if, for uh, comments, feedback. The engagement for the development has been extensive over six months internally and externally. And of course, we use the standard six point methodology that's been adopted for development of strategic workforce plans across NHS Wales. Um, we've also made sure that we've taken into account the Welsh Audit Office uh, recommendations last year when they reviewed all strategic workforce planning approaches across Wales. Uh, and whilst we came out with reasonable assurance at that time, they did give us some recommendations and we have incorporated those. I can give you the assurance as well of the approval route that's been taken with the, the plan, having gone to the executive leadership team, the people and culture committee. And yesterday, we also used the opportunity at a partnership forum to go into a bit more detail and, and talk through some of the uh, broader impacts and risks that are referenced in there. Um, what I am pleased to also tell you it will be the first organisational specific strategic workforce plan in the NHS in Wales. What we do have in Wales is um, through HEIW, a significant number of profession specific workforce plans, but there is nothing yet out there in terms of an organizational one. And having talked to my peers um, in the uh, HR uh, director workforce uh, world last week, there is a real desire to use um, our work as a template to start developing that organizational lens because we recognize what we've talked about in our plan is exactly the same challenges that our colleagues across the NHS are experiencing. And actually, unless we work collectively and in a system-wide way, we are going to struggle to, to address some of the issues. Um, so just wanted you to, to be aware of that. And again, in particular, I would point you towards the four objectives that we've outlined and hope that they reflect um, in a broad enough way what we're going to focus on, obviously reference the risks. Um, and again, just to give you a, that final level of assurance that the once this is hopefully endorsed, the internal governance routes around making sure it stays relevant, dynamic and live will be done through our integrated um, strategic workforce group. So happy to take questions, Chair, but really hoping that uh, colleagues will be able to endorse today. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a really interesting document. So questions or comments or statements? Yeah, hi. Thank you, Chair. Um, just comment from me. So first of all, um, thank you, Angie, to you and your team for all the work, work on that. As you say, there's a huge amount of work that clearly underpins that. Um, I've seen and been involved in a lot of strategic workforce planning um, in, in the past. And for me, it's really comprehensive but succinct. Um, I think it's got all the core components that I would expect to see in a strategic workforce plan. And I can see that you reflect the you know, external market as well. So I think it was a really good balance um, there and certainly something that I would think um, a lot of people can sort of just re reference, I think, as we go forward. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Any other? Yes, go ahead. Just to say that um, People and Culture Committee endorsed, or welcomed and, and endorsed the plan. And also, I think there was the re recognition there that this is really fundamental to our longer term strategic vision. Um, so just wanted to add that, Chair. Good. Thank you very much. I'd add just a, just a couple of comments. Um, I mean, clearly, we, you know, we are an, an older population, but it was very clear in there. And I thought your top five risks, which I got in front of me, I thought they, they really sort of crystallised in my mind some of the issues around our workforce. I thought that was that was really interesting. And the increasing age of the current workforce is your is your top risk. And the and the graphs show very clearly how over the coming years there'll be a significant number moving towards retirement. I thought very interesting. I think I read somewhere that only about two percent of people have actually left on retirement of, of the current time. But it's going to be like going off a cliff, isn't it? Yeah. Because so many people are, are approaching that that we could be seduced into thinking it's not a problem. And it's clearly clear that it is. The other thing I thought I'd just mention is got it's that's an issue quite close to my heart, is that I was really pleased to see it included volunteers. But again, it's, it's very easy to forget that, you know, we've got, what, 700 or something of volunteers around all, all over Wales, and they're a really important part of the service that we provide. So I was really pleased to see that that was there. Um, the other thing I thought was very interesting was that there's a graph showing, or well, I guess it's displayed in a graph form, of the destinations for where people leave. 
And unfortunately, at the moment, the vast majority, we have no idea. And I just wonder whether, I presume you can try and do something about that so we get a better, better insight into where people are going. Yeah, happy to answer that, Chair. And in particular, we've done some significant work about that sort of um, ex-interview moving on uh, approach because that it is voluntary. Individuals' willingness to share that has been a, a key issue for us. So we've tr we've just introduced a new, much more um, um, user-friendly approach to exit interview. But I suppose moving back beyond that, what we're hoping is that we can get to people earlier if there are issues and avoid them leaving if there is a particular issue. But if they are leaving because they are developing and progressing, we just need to be able to feed that data in. So absolutely recognised. And as part of the work we did, um, and we've raised it at the People and Culture Committee around retention and turnover, that point about really strong data that shows us really clearly where people are going and how, where we're losing them to uh, is key. When we lose people across the NHS, that's we're still positive that is they are retained they are retained within the NHS in Wales when we're losing them outside of that that becomes a bigger challenge for us I think but can give you that reassurance that absolutely we're really trying to make sure we get excellent data it'll be interesting really, because it may well be that it always seems to me that we've got two very different populations well got lots of different population, but, but particularly two populations within the call center of a population which tends to be fairly fast moving by nature because call centers whether it's in the nhs or whether it's in insurance or any finance or banking they're similar environments they tend to have a higher turnover yeah. they tend to have more, lower age individuals yeah. there so they tend to be more more, more, more or more movable to work and then you've got the more static populations everybody. so it may well be that a lot of the unknowns have left and the other thing that struck me as well was in the other graph which you displayed the, the length of service we do have a very large number of people employed who've only been with us a year or thereabouts but i suspect a lot of those are probably in the call centers yes yeah, so mm -hmm. definitely in those um the, the call center environments and again just on that point what we've been doing is that warm last welcome so really focused on their induction uh three month check-in how are you doing how are, how are things going? And then a 12 month celebration, which is an organizational initiative on top of what managers are doing locally. And we recognize that first year is, is critical yeah. and that we really need to retain them. Um, but I, I think the other point I would make is we aren't seeing this as a sort of homogenous community. We are looking at this through the lens of those different professions to see how can we support colleagues? Because we know that different parts of the organization have different issues you just referenced there in the call center. I was working with Andy this week about that paramedic workforce. We've been talking about a nursing workforce. So really trying to get a lens of the organization through a profession route is probably the best way we're gonna address some of these risks. Very good. And the, other, the only other point I was gonna make was an issue which I'm seeing in another place I, I'm involved in. Is, is a distinction between people who are working from home and people who are working in offices and the impact of hybrid working. I'm, just, I'm not sure I missed it. I might have missed it, but did, did, you, did you reflect anything about hybrid working and the impact or the differences in terms of you know, retention and, and, and support to people who work predominantly at home? I, I don't think it's referenced in the level that it would really stand out to you. What I can say is it's one of the things that we've been thinking about more generally in the organisation in terms of when you hear about people needing regular support, regular check-ins, it is different, which is why I come back to those different parts of the organisation. We're also just at the moment um, ready to share, we're going to bring it to the executive leadership team about some principles of hybrid working, because I don't think we are not in the space of saying we want to direct or mandate, but we do recognise we probably need more around um, key principles that people, particularly leaders, should be thinking about when you are managing people in a hybrid way. Because you're right, that sense of connection and that sense of... Um, yeah. How, how do I know if this organisation values me can be much more problematic if somebody is hybrid? No, I, I think that's right, because it's very easy for us. And I think, you know, it, it's, it's fairly natural when you think about the ambulance service to think about people at the front line, to think about people in the call centre who you know, are working all the time in full view. But actually, an awful lot of our support services in finance and IT and so on are actually potentially working from yeah. home, governance teams and, and so on. And I know, you know, there's a lot of research now beginning to emerge about the consequences of working from home. And although for some people it suits them very well, for others it doesn't. And if people can make the choice appropriate to what they prefer, that's fantastic. But if actually people who would prefer to be in office are more or less forced to work from home, it can create all sorts of issues yes. and problems, um, which, which are sort of new to the workplace. And it's interesting because we've had this conversation with our digital recruitment, where actually if we didn't offer a hybrid solution, we wouldn't be able to attract people. Yeah, and again, that's 
the, the beauty of this is about making sure that we think about that point again about what type of profession, what role are people doing, and listening to what those people say. But actually, exactly right, that research around really being clear where hybrid is absolutely right and where it perhaps isn't. Um, but, you know, we've had some success definitely, and I know with our, with our digital recruitment, by being able to offer mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. sense of flexibility. Right. But, yes. Um, yeah, because I think, I think the world's moved on. I think uh, for a while, there was a kind of Rees Mogg argument, wasn't it, about you, sh you should all be at home or you should all be at work and you should all be coming to the office and so on. I think actually people have gone beyond that now mm -hmm. and have recognised that actually mm -hmm. hybrid working can be very effective. Um, but actually, you've got, to, you've got to manage differently and you've got to support people differently. And you also have to be alert to the fact that not everybody necessarily thrives in a in a home environment or thrives in a work environment. So it's it's about positively managing it yeah, yeah. and being being sort of in charge of it rather than just letting it happen by by default. And just on that, in terms of the work that we're doing around leadership development, our WAST way, the key part of that is how do you lead virtual teams? How do you lead in a hybrid way? How do you lead colleagues that you're working with every day? Because yeah. we've got to do that, haven't yeah, we? That's right. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Okay, any other comments or questions about that? Yes, just down. Thanks, Chair. Only, only one observation, really, that I made at the exec team when we discussed this, which is, well, it's, two, it's a sort of kind of two-part observation, really. One is that, you know, we've always been a, a pretty positive employer. You know, we've not really struggled to recruit. As we look at the workforce demographic, the age demographic coming forward, um, the post-pandemic legacy, the NHS narrative, etc., it may become more challenging for us. That hybrid working thing, I was just listening to something on Radio 4 quite recently about um, encouraging teachers potentially to work four days a week and one at home to catch up with admin as part of a shortage of teacher recruitment, making it more attractive when graduates are making choices, they're making choices that are in jobs that are not necessarily, you know, um, five days a week in the office. Um, and the other thing is, We've talked a lot in the first half of today's meeting about how we reprofile this organisation, the type of work that we're going to be doing in the future. That will need a different type of employee, not the traditional ambulance service type of employee. And actually, that means both engaging with, with young people on what those opportunities might be, but also with education providers on the nature of how they train the professional of the future. Um, and also picking up you know, Johnny's experience recently, which was very positive on digital recruitment, but actually making sure that people are cognizant, both for us as WAST and in the broader NHS, about the types of roles that we actually have on offer, because I think people understand the kind of clinical roles. They know nurses, doctors, paramedics, therapists. Mm. They don't really understand HI specialists, HR specialists, mm. you know, OD specialists, comms people, you know, planners, all those people that, that we need. So I think there is going to be a challenge for us in terms of our position in the marketplace as part of that wider NHS um, in the future. So we just need to be mindful of that and start planning for it. No, thank, thanks. So I think I think that's right. And actually, the other couple of points that I've sort of just come back to my mind was like, that, that struck me. I hadn't been aware of, if I should have been probably, the, the reduction in school leavers and the fact that actually there's a there's a, a, a shrinking pool of people potentially coming into the workforce in Wales, particularly perhaps, so, but probably more widely than not just Wales, I guess. But and I think that point around the economically inactive mm. and the impact of that, mm. particularly in this, you know, in Wales, mm. and I think that's why the work that we've been doing more generally about making this a great place to work, mm. ensuring mm. that people it becomes more critical, but it's also to Estelle's point, we are competing with lots of other employers mm -hmm. to ensure that mm -hmm. we are an attractive organization. And mm -hmm. interestingly, what I would say is whilst all the work we've been doing around culture change, and if you think about some of the media press around mm -hmm. ambulance services more generally, we are seeing people still applying for our roles. We are seeing people engaging with us and saying, actually part of the reason mm -hmm. we're applying is because we've seen you be so visible around this, but there are risks associated mm -hmm. with it, aren't we? Mm -hmm. And it is a much smaller pool. Yeah. And the other thought that occurred to me just as you were speaking there is that if you want to be a paramedic, there's a fairly limited number of places where you could apply for because you want to be a paramedic in a paramedic organisation. If you want to be in finance or in HR or in IT, you could work just as well for Waitrose as you could for Welsh Ambulance. Although it would be so much better here. Well, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no offence, Waitrose. But we do need to bear that in mind, don't we, that, 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 that our employment practices and, our, and the way we look after people actually has to, in a certain parts of our workforce, has to mirror the wider economic environment, not just health service.
Um, and then Welsh language was the other thing I was going to mention as well, that I was surprised to see something like 24 percent slight increase in the numbers of people who have a, a reasonable level of, of Welsh language competence. So, it's good. Okay, so I think we're, oh yes, Hannah. Um, just, so I think, think the uh, it, it looks really, really good and really positive, and it's great to see the depth of thought. I think one of the things that is um, on my mind particularly is the, I suppose the 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 vast amount of change that we've seen between generations around expectations of work and what people are looking for. And I think you've alluded to that. One thing I'm quite mindful of is that at the moment, obviously. And because it's how it happens usually with seniority, people making these really important decisions are of a very different generation than the people that you're looking to enact them in time. So I just wondered what um, what your plans are in terms of, um, I, it's, I don't know that it's exactly consulting, but sort of taking some advice from, um, I suppose people who might come into this category, some of our, our younger workforce, but possibly also a focus group of university leavers or school leavers from elsewhere. Um, yeah, I, I just wondered kind of what your plans were around that. Yeah, happy to give you and, and really um, you know, opportune because we've been talking about that under our umbrella of equality, diversity and inclusion, but also we have a variety of networks in this organization. Um, and if I particularly think about um, our Voices Network, which is very diverse, uh, very sort of demographically diverse, uh, but also our student population, particularly of those newly qualified paramedics, but also the first students. Andy and I were with the first year students last week, week before, talking to them, asking for their opinions, challenge, getting them to challenge us, because you're absolutely right. We have to be really mindful. We were in a meeting yesterday where a colleague referenced the fact that we were all quite mature in a polite way um, and so that point about not just listening to the voices of, of people who look like us sound like us and have the same experience but it's a key part that that point about how do we keep testing and how do we get the feedback from those groups so I, I can give you some reassurance that we're using as many networks as possible to test things out particularly if I think about the strategic workforce plan that went through our networks really trying to challenge it and and keeping those voices heard because it's the key thing for us making sure we just don't end up becoming disconnected that's fab and that offers a lot of assurance i think it's been interesting in the media in the last couple of weeks there is increased polarization around sort of you know the oh well why don't they want to do the jobs like i did um and well there aren't any jobs like you did and you know that, that I think there are some sort of it's getting some airtime yeah. um in, in some fairly kind of mainstream media outlets so I think what you're doing is really positive and, and we certainly want to um also make sure that we show that we've done that yeah. um so thank you very much good okay well <clears throat> thanks very much everybody um the task <clears throat> before us was to formally approve the strategic workforce plan so we're looking around to make sure we're all happy to approve it which we obviously are good so duly approved Thank you very much. And we note the workforce risks, which were very interesting. So we'll move on to the next item, which is item 14. And we're going to invite Felicia O'Shea to, to join us, I think. So Just see if she's there. Screen. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> yes, yes, that'd be great. Yes. Lizzie, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. So a warm welcome to you. And I think Angie's going to uh, give a little introduction. It, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, absolutely delighted to have Lizzie with us today and, and also to have a focus here at the board on speaking up safely and to give you an update on the progress we've been doing, but also to celebrate and, and shine a light on October being Speaking Up Safely Month. Uh, Lizzie's been with us now, um, I think about four or five months, although I've told her, you know, that means she's, you know, been here forever. Uh, we're absolutely delighted to have her. Uh, she brings with her a wealth of experience, uh, and I'm absolutely thrilled that she has an opportunity to share some of that learning, but also promote what uh, we've been doing to the board. So over to you, Lizzie. Thanks so much, Ange. So, um, yeah, first of all, thank you as well from me for allowing Speaking Up Safely to be on the agenda this morning. Um, I think it shows a real importance um, to the organisation of how seriously we are um, taking wanting to hear our people's voices and what is going on um, in our organisation. So, um, 
lovely to meet some of you um and uh i know you're probably aware of the work that i'm doing and you'll be aware of my role but i thought i'd give a little bit more of a brief background about um why i'm here so um my my career background is in ambulance i uh, worked uh, 10 years over in southwest ambulance service the last three and a half years as a freedom to speak up guardian there um so i do have experience of dealing with with these types of concerns that are coming through um, but why is my role so important here for, for WAST? And um, <clears throat> my role is here to provide that alternative safe space for people to be able to raise concerns about anything that's going on in, in their work life in the organisation. And we always advocate that concerns go through the traditional routes. We want people to feel safe to raise concerns through their line management in their local areas. We know that sometimes that's not possible. We know that sometimes um, it feels unsafe to do so. We know that sometimes our managers might not feel empowered to be able to deal with, with concerns. And so by allowing us to have that alternative and safe space, it means that people will start to um, filter through some of the more serious concerns that we know that will be in our organization and um, provide them that safe and confidential space to fear less about repercussions of speaking up. Um, so what have we implemented since arriving? And it has only been just about four months, Ange. Don't keep um, making out that I've been I've been here forever. Um, but so far, we one of the most important things I think we've implemented is um, a, a secure and safe confidential database. So um, I have the ability to uh, record all our concerns that only I have access to. Um, where we can then start to uh, see themes and trends of where pockets of culture might be concerning us. And obviously we've got low numbers at the moment with me um, only just arriving. Mm -hmm. But as, as the time goes on in a, in a year, for example, I expect us to have a good database of um, concerns where we can start to see, okay, we've got a pockets of concerns around sexual safety or around bullying harassment in this area let's put some cultural work into this area let's target some work to um try and improve the culture in that area or actually i've not heard any concerns over in this area and they're not hearing concerns in the people services team either but we've got a high level of sickness in this area so we know something's going on but we're not hearing so we need to put some um cultural work in those areas as well um so that's one of the i think one of the important things that we've introduced um the themes that we're starting to see in my uh, short time of being here through Speaking Up Safely is probably around incivility, around how our colleagues behave um, with, with one another. Um, and um, some already starting to see some pockets of culture where we can definitely make some, make some improvements. Um, I'm also seeing that there is a, a, a real fear for our people to, to raise concerns, to be the one that um, is brave enough to say that this is happening in the organisation. Um, and when uh, when I first arrived, there was um, people were using the anonymous platform quite frequently. As I'm starting to get, a, people are starting to get um, an idea of who I am. Still, we're at the very, very beginnings of it. Um, the anonymous levels are dropping slightly um, to people feeling like they can come to me in a confidential manner. Um, and we'll have to see whether that is a coincidence or whether that will be a trend that that will continue. Um, but one of the fears I'm also hearing is from our managers or our leaders in the organisation around the ability for people to raise anonymous concerns um, and whether they, um, you know, how do we handle that? And uh, is there a malicious element to that? Um, and I think from the paper, you can see that actually the myth that everybody's coming anonymously and um, it, it is not there, that actually most people are coming confidentially or, or, or openly, which is, which is a good thing. Um, but what the anonymous concerns do allow for is some of those really deeper, more concerning concerns to come through and for us to at least know what's happening in, in our organisation and see if there's ways that we can tackle um, some of that behaviour. Um, so moving on then to um, Speak Up Month, being asked to talk a little bit about what we're, uh, what we're doing. So um, 
every year October is speak up month this year the theme yeah. is the power of listening so I know you've read the paper but some of the things that we're doing we've got a good strong comms plan in place um myself Angie Jason and Laura Stevens our um uh network chair for the culture champions have created a great video that really narrows down and explains quickly what speaking up safely is and how people can access it so we'll be sharing that out um and something that um i'm hoping to do is get out there and speaking to to our people getting them to know who i am you know uh, whether they feel that i'm a trustworthy person to share concerns with and only yesterday was i in um uh langana call uh, call center and um it really reminded me of that one emd that's sitting there taking calls they don't necessarily see siren they don't necessarily see everything that's going on how do we get to those people how do we get to those people to let them know that they have a safe place to speak and it's getting out there and speaking with them that's the only way sometimes we're going to be able to get to these people but also it gave me a stark reminder of um how big our organization is and how wide um issues could be going on out there and how we really need to uncover some of um some of the deeper darker stuff that that is happening um and also the, the big thing was as i drove over to kamath and driving through powis it was a stark reminder of my goodness how do these people access healthcare here no wonder people you know it, it's a struggle for people um such a vast area and and i think as somebody that works in the corporate side it was a real reminder of what it's like for the people that that we um we are hoping to help the majority of people that will access um access my service um so um somebody asks for you in a bit more detail um so obviously speaking up sits in the people and cultural culture directorate but um my work or our work in speaking up safely will affect all your directorates um ultimately at some point um it is likely that something will come through in your directorate so if you want to understand speaking up safely in more detail please put in a, a, a meeting with him with me we could talk in it in more detail um i'm happy to come and talk to teams i've started that in the operations directorate talking with um heads of services locality managers doms um, uh, around what it is and how they can access the service, but also how they can support um, the people that they're um, leading on how to access the service or if they're going through um, something um, raising concerns. So, yeah, come and come and talk to me or, um, uh, you know, I'd, I'd happily talk about speaking up safely all day long. Um, the listen and learn um, sort of events that we're trying to encourage leaders uh, to do in the organisation in October. Um, it would be great if you could encourage your teams to sort of host something like that. It, it, we are putting some comms out around how people can do it, but ultimately it's just putting aside dedicated time, half an hour maybe with the team to just ask that big cultural question of how does it feel around here? You know, if they could start with something like that, how does it feel around here? And allow that open dialogue between teams of um you know what's working well what improvements can be made how can we help people feel safer to talk to their teams um to talk within their teams just some low level changes that might make a day to day difference for for our people um and then something that would be really great is to hear the board's commitment and for our people to hear the board's commitment about this want and desire for our organization to become a place where we have a good speak up and listen up culture where people feel they can be heard that they will be listened to and something will be done about it and so um, my ask is for every board member um, here to uh, send me over a pledge of how you personally will commit to um, creating a speak up and listen up culture in WAST um, and then hopefully we can maybe create a, a nice poster or some info some comms to share that with the organization um, to for them to really realize that we are wanting to hear people's lived experiences in in WAST. Um, so I hope that's given you a bit of a brief around um, about speaking up safely, what we're doing in October, um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Lizzie, thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that very comprehensive and a really, really interesting uh, paper report. Um, Andrew, do you want to add anything? And then we'll come to Kerry, maybe see if she wants anything. Uh, only just to say thank you, Lizzie. I know that was, you know, tough it's your first time meeting everybody and you know so thank you very much and uh, again we know we're at the early stages of really trying to embed this approach but um 
the commitment is there and you know i hope this gives that level of assurance to the board so yeah i think you came to pcc didn't it Kerry? yeah well it's an ongoing priority for pcc i guess what i would add is that i think pcc have taken lots of assurance mm -hmm. around i think particularly the senior level commitment that you know lizzie's in post um and that actually people are, are speaking up and we've said at board several times it's important that whilst that is negative that actually we want people to speak up so as we see those numbers rise that we should take confidence in that and angie i think you talk about potentially two years before that starts to come the other way so um i think we've taken lots of assurance from this work and um yeah i think it's really helpful that we're thinking about you know what is the pledge i guess there's something for me around um how when we go out as non-exec directors and do visits so it seems quite obvious about how you talk about this but i wonder whether there's just something maybe a couple of bullet points and um, so there is a bit of consistency in it i think that might be helpful thank you gary so opening up to any other questions or, or comments anybody wishes to make Damon. yeah thanks um Thanks, uh, Lizzie. I, I, I just mindful as you're speaking that we haven't actually touched base. So um, as a reminder for me that we need to get in touch. I am. I mean, you know, a lot of these things cross over with a lot of the work that we do as, as trade unionists in respect, in respect of people coming up to, you know, tell us about their issues and things. Um, so I'd be really keen if we could, you know, see if there's areas we can help each other in, in that arena. I, I, I For the record, it's, it's a fantastic um, initiative by the Trust. It is going to transform things. Um, so I just want to put that on the record. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you. Um, hi, Lizzie. And yeah, nice to meet you. And, and great to hear about the work that you're doing. Um, my question was just particularly as a non-exec director would welcome any um, advice or kind of your experience. I know you said that you've done this role in other places around how as non-execs we can support this in a really positive way. Um, it, I, I can imagine quite clearly how I do that if I was managing a team, but I'm I, I'm struggling a little bit with how I might do that in my role um, while remaining obviously in the role that I'm supposed to hold. So um, whether it's something for now or something that we can pick up another time, it would be great if you could share some of your experience in that area. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Hannah. So um, although, uh, so Freedom to Speak Up is in, is in England and they're sort of um, governed and trained by the National Guardian's office. And recently they have put out a video for non-execs um, for that exact reason of non-execs not um, necessarily thinking, how can I help? They want to help, but what can we actually do? And so I can definitely share that video with you. I can find access to it. But also it'd be great to get together um, myself and the non-execs and talk about it in a bit more detail. What ideas can we can we have for how you guys can really help push forward this agenda as well? More than happy to do that. Great, thank you. Mm. Well, th th thanks, Hannah, because that was exactly going through my mind as well. <laughs> I was sitting here thinking, you know, how can I as an individual support this? And um, I mean, clearly the board as a whole can be seen to represent a full commitment behind this. And I'm sure I'm speaking for everybody that we absolutely do. But on an individual basis, when you're when you're kind of coming into limited contact on you know, visits and so on, it's, uh, it's not quite so obvious what you might do. But uh, that, that video will be really interesting. So please do find it and give us all access to that. And yeah, and, and just building on that, because um, uh, uh, Kerry and I have had the conversations because the video is very uh, English centric, it is, uh, and there are perhaps some issues in terms of accessibility, I would say. So Lizzie is working behind the scenes on can we develop something that is more bespoke, that would be more helpful. So again, I think that's going to be really useful. We're also looking at the policies around this. But I think um, Kerry's point about um, some sort of prompters, some ideas for questions, particularly when people are out and about because it is that your ability to um, gain intelligence but also just touch pace with people is pivotal to us and it's then how do we feed that back in so we will take that away as an action just to help with some prompts because I think that would be really powerful. I think Damon did you okay? Okay what's what's uh, what's I mean, you're looking, looking at that graph um, showing where the where, when you know, where the issues predominantly were um, sexual safety and then inappropriate behaviour and bullying. If you put the, the the bullying and the inappropriate behaviour, it's a huge block, um, which really tells us something, I think, about 
what's about that perhaps going on. And the other thought I had as well from what Kerry was saying was in terms of we're likely to see an increasing number of these cases you know, being reported. We hope we are anyway. I guess we can take some learning from the health and safety environment where there was some time ago a reluctance for people to report near misses. And then when you, when you encourage workforces to feel safe to report near misses, accidents that never happened but could have happened as a result of people could learn you suddenly find that when you when you when you create a safe place for people to give that kind of kind of report you see your near miss accident score beginning to increase month for month for month it's not suggesting that you're becoming a more dangerous place to work it's suggesting quite the opposite but you've got to see through the, the data to understand what it what it's telling you and the fact that we see more of these may not tell us that it's getting worse it may just tell us that we've got a, a a more open environment where people are able to, to speak up. So we need to interpret that right. Yeah. Yeah, just, <clears throat> just on that final point that you were making there, Chair. Uh, so Lizzie, I'm, I'm sure you will uh, be connecting, if you haven't already, with uh, Wendy and Claire in my team, uh, who are both leading work around near misreporting at the moment. So uh, I know that there's lots of connections that we're making it organisationally, but near misreporting is something we've got a real focus on from a quality and safety perspective as a development area for us across the organisation. So uh, I'll just kind of nom nominate that out and make sure that, that Lizzie's uh, connected in. Thank you. Okay, just looking around to make sure I'm not missing any other any hands anywhere. I think that's that's. Oh, uh, yes. Can I just Sorry. say one other thing? I think there is a problem. That there is a challenge with the training. Um, Angie's referenced it. So Lizzie and I have had an email exchange. I've raised it with HGIW, but um, I think I did the four different modules, um, and I think there's room for improvement. And it's not only about being England centric. So if we do, if, if training for senior leaders is a priority, I think we need to look at how, you know, whether that's HEIW, but if this is an important issue for us, which it is, I think we probably need to take an action to. And, and I could just come back. We absolutely mm -hmm. recognize it. We are potentially a bit further ahead than quite a lot of the rest of the NHS in Wales in terms of the Guardian infrastructure, the frameworks, et cetera. So Lizzie is connecting, and we're connecting through HIW to say this is something we need it. You know, we think it's really important. So we want to help drive that. So it's absolutely on the, the list of priorities. Okay, thank you very much. There's a there's a quite a long list of things we, we're required to do from a governance perspective. I won't read them all out, but essentially it's about noting this and supporting the various activities, uh, the October activities, but also the, the longer term activities as well. And uh, your 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 plea for us all to send you a pledge has been noted as well. So thank you, Lizzie. I'm sure we'll we'll, we'll do that. I certainly will. Um, so on that basis, we'll say thank you very much, Lizzie, for joining us. It's been great. Carry on doing what you're doing. It's really important. We absolutely support you. <clears throat> the board is fully behind all of this, as you well know. And in Angie's new role, slightly revised role, focusing on culture, I'm sure this is something, Angie, you're going to be yeah, yeah. really all over. Um, and again, that's a real, I think, significant message is a flag in the sand, isn't it, that says that from an exec level, you know, we're creating an executive post, which is really focusing on culture. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. Thank Good. you. All right. You're very welcome. Nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you, Lizzie. Right, we, we move on then to item 15, um, our grilling. Thank you, uh, <laughs> Chair. So um, the board's got before it uh, the report from the Welsh Parliament Health and Social Care Committee uh, dated August, which follows an appearance that you and I had, uh, Chair, along with Andy, um, at a general scrutiny uh, event uh, held by them in May this year. Uh, the report... Um, uh, sets out seven recommendations which the committee have made. Some apply directly to us uh, and some apply to system partners. Um, as you would expect, we've already begun to consider uh, our response to those recommendations. We've discussed it uh, a couple of times in the executive leadership team already, uh, and a couple of the recommendations have also been considered uh, in more detail in Lee's uh, op directorate structure. Um, the paper sets out what we're proposing to do with each of the recommendations uh, and ask the board to note that we'll bring something back in due course uh, to provide an update. Okay, okay. Um, thank you very much. So any questions, any comments from anybody in relation to this? I think it's, it's very interesting. I mean, recommendation two about the eight minutes was interesting, mm. uh, which reflects our, our general thinking about that. 
another recommendation. I think it reflects the fact that this committee actually, I think, you know, you and I went into it thinking that it was perhaps going to be a fairly benign conversation about things. It actually turned out to be a more, uh, a more forensic examination of the, of the performance, but also the way in which the Welsh Ambulance sits within the wider sector and things as well. So I'm beginning to recognise that the Ambulance Service can do more than just convey people to a hospital. So I think that's a, that's a positive thing to, to recognise that the, uh, the politicians recognise that as well as the professionals within the health system. Um, any other comments, questions? Just quickly, in terms of follow-up then, do, do, do you need to reappear, as it were, or are they asking for progress reports? Yeah. So what's yeah. the, yeah. the yeah. feedback yeah. loop? Yeah, so we, we, we haven't been invited to reappear, but we expect we will do probably on an annual basis you know, in, in 12 months time. But there are there is an ask for a written update to the committee on right. progress of the recommendations and we'll, we'll make those uh, updates uh, in due course. Yeah. Okay, I think that's straightforward. So we can we can move on. We're just asked to note that, which we do. do. So item 16, EMS operational transformation. Uh, Rachel. Thank you, um, and it's a real pleasure to um, bring this report, which was uh, discussed as well at length at the Finance and Performance Committee. Um, having talked earlier in the IMTP paper about the <coughs> new transformation programme that we have got underway, sometimes I think we, you know, we, we work at such a pace that we kind of finish work and we you know, put it to one side and crack on with the next thing. So it's a really good opportunity to reflect back on actually the transformation programme that the organisation has been undertaking in relation to its EMS services in the last few years. Uh, and I think as execs, when we, when, we, when we look back at all the things that have been achieved over the last few years, it's, it's really quite um, impressive, I think. Um, so this, uh, I know Hugh, um, my uh, assistant director of... Uh, Commissioning and Performance presented this paper to FMP, and he was the SRO for this uh, transformation program, uh, and did a, a such a brilliant job of bringing together you know colleagues from across the organisation. Um, and this report is it's a lengthy report, but it's it sets out I suppose the, the scale uh, of what was achieved um, and some of the outcomes uh, that we that we got from it. So in terms of the scale, a huge recruitment efforts. We were very fortunate to secure um, quite significant investment from commissioners uh, and it allowed us to increase our uh, frontline staff by 343 full-time equivalents. Um, a difficult part of the programme was to re-roster all of our frontline uh, services um, and I know that was something that, that it took a long time the trade unions were really closely with us on it was difficult uh, but it what it did was ensure that our rosters aligned with the demand uh, patterns that we saw coming in uh, and actually the efficiency gain that we got from that is it was the equivalent of about 72 people we had a new type of response uh, the charu response which replaced the rrvs that in itself was a huge again program of work in terms of developing the service, training, recruiting people into, into the new, uh, and, and then you know, people who've been doing RRVs for a long time, that was, that was again, quite a difficult uh, time for some people, uh, but I think through Hugh and the team managed well and sensitively. Um, and also we, we did a lot of work on increasing the numbers of uh, colleagues in our CSD, uh, and we're able to increase the consultant close rates. The, I think the that Hugh would kind of probably say this the disappointment in terms of this program is that pretty much all the actions that we'd set out we did. Um, but the outcome, which was meant to be you know improving our uh, response times in particular, didn't come to pass, as we know, and we talked about in uh, in the MIQPR and other reports. Uh, and that's because the system around us changed. It, at the same time that we were, we were undertaking these actions, and in particular, as we know, the impact of uh, the increasing handover uh, delays uh, meant that we were, you know, the capacity we were putting in was then lost um, uh, in terms of that uh, part of the system. Um, but I think the kind of, I suppose, comfort that Hugh draws is that it would have been a lot worse if we hadn't done all of these actions. So that, you know, that I think is is something. <laughs> Uh, but I just wanted to pay credit to um, Hugh in particular, that he had a, he had, you know, a, a team of people around uh, and including 
Damon and, and trade union partners as well, who really worked through some tricky issues together uh, and just, I think, was a really good demonstration of how as an organisation, when we work together, we can achieve, you know, really great things, um, which gives me comfort and confidence then as we embark on this, uh, this new transformation uh, programme. Um, so happy to take any, you know, um, uh, questions of detail, um, but I think it's just, as I say, mostly here as a reflection of, um, you know, a really good piece of work uh, that was done across the organisation over the last few years. Good. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I think my, my immediate response would be, I don't think we should feel downhearted at all. I mean, I think that clearly you reflect in the fact that some of the some of the performance measures, such as eight minute response time and amber response times and, and so on, um, haven't moved significantly even though we've done all this transformation, but what we have seen is a massive increase in the demand for the service. So the number of red calls, for example, per month has gone up dramatically from two or three years ago. The number of people calling in the ones, calling the nines has gone up dramatically. And you know, it, is in, it is inevitable, had you not done this transformation, there would have been a probably a very dramatic reduction in the, in the performance. So actually, I think that we should be taking huge comfort that actually we've been able to sustain admittedly not particularly, you know, particularly good response rates, but we have been able to retain those in the face of this increasing tsunami of, of, of demand for our services. And we would never have been able to do that had this work not been done. So it's difficult to quantify that. It's difficult yeah. to know what might have been. It's a kind of known unknown, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think, we should, I think we should celebrate, not, not to kind of be ashamed of the fact, but I think we should celebrate the fact that we've been able to hold response rates in, 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 in the light of increasing handover delays, increasing customer demand, as it were, uh, you know, clinical demand. So anyway, open to questions. Peter? Yeah, thanks, uh, Chair. I just want to um, echo Rachel's point. She spoke at length last week at F&P, and I think his candour and his, you know, transparency was there, and he, I think he probably did un un undersell his role and the team, because you said there's a tremendous amount of work that's been uh, gone on there. Um, and we were certainly content as an F and P, you know, to recommend the program be closed and that the deliverables have been done. And uh, I absolutely agree with you, Chair. You know, the the outcomes may not have been there, but it's not it's not for want of putting an awful lot of work. Uh, and going forward, of course, these issues are well known. So it's not as if we're dropping anything off, if you like, mm -hmm. in terms of the continuity of what we're doing. So certainly as a committee, we were we're happy to recommend to the board that the program be closed off and, and, and congratulate Rachel Hugh and the team for the successful delivery of many, many of the of the activities. Good. Thank you, Peter. And I, and I would just come back on this issue around it not be met, because I think in retrospect, when this when the transformation was being delivered, it might have been the case that if you had had sufficient clairvoyancy to, 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 to anticipate the, the dramatic increase in demand for our services, you might have set an objective which would have been closer to holding things steady, in which case we'd be sitting here celebrating the fact that you actually had met the objective. As it turned out, of course, you were not to know that the increase in demand would be coming uh, from all sides, um, in which case, you know, we have the result that we have. The other comment I'd make, by the way, is generally, is that I've seen elsewhere in other in environments, it's very often the case in commercial environments where transformation programmes they, they get delivered, but then there's a second transformation and a third and a fourth as in the normal course of events. And actually things never get closed off properly. And actually it's really nice to see this, this kind of thing properly being being yeah. closed down and being being things sort of because we are already in the middle of another transformation yeah. program, aren't yeah. we? Yeah. So we, this has been overtaken kind of by events almost. So I think it's it's really good discipline and it's really good to see that we're able to see a document which shows exactly what has been done before. And that kind of gives, I think it gives credibility. And it also gives encouragement to the new transformation programs that we're embarking on now that shows that we can do it because here's the, here's the evidence that we can take a complicated program which involves lots of moving parts and deliver a result at the end of it. Any other any other comments or questions from anybody around around the table? We are asked to, to note it, I guess. So we, we duly do. Thank, Thank you very much. Good. Okay. Then we move on to oh governance report. Trish. Thanks, Chair. I'm just going to draw three things out of this. First is the Chair's action. So we need to formally ratify the two decisions that were made by Chair's action. So the first was on the 7th of August, where the Board approved business case and the associated contract award recommendation for um, discretionary capital expenditure for the new facility at Shangana. 
um, that went to the board because it was over the chief executive's delegated limit and we agreed uh, the contract award recommendation in the amount of 953,000. The second one uh, was on the 27th of August, the board had previously approved damages and costs on the clinical negligence case. Um, uh, this was an additional approval for an additional quantum for costs uh, that were approved by, um, by chair's action. So the board is asked to ratify those two decisions. Um, the, other, the other point that I'd raise is that there has been um, a, a non-compliance with the standing orders that we picked up when we were preparing for the annual general meeting, which was our standing order says that the minutes of that AGM are approved in the next ordinary board meeting, which we, we missed out. So we'll make sure that that happens from here on in, but next year's, last year's minutes will be approved tomorrow. And then tomorrow's minutes will be approved in November, if that makes sense. Uh, but just to formally note that. And the last one is um, the biannual presentation, I guess, of the heat map of board, board visits. This is for the period 1st of March to the 8th of August. All board members have got access to the link. Um, I'll, we'll recirculate that link. but It'll take you straight to the heat map. It's also available for all staff as well to be able to see, and you can manipulate dates, um, uh, et cetera, as well. So you'll see the visits to stations or corporate buildings, because there's a few different categories um, from by the board is, is more than doubled in the same period to last year. And also we're showing more visits to central and west rather than the, the main hubs. Um, but the visits to EDs sort of uh, are less favorable compared to the same period last year. The board has agreed that we would be, when we're setting agenda um, for board meetings going forward, we're going to look at alternative trust sites to hold our board meetings. And, and I guess the intention then is to be able to position members to coincide visits with those uh, meetings as well. And of course, our CEO roadshows, long service awards are a really good opportunity to actually get around and see our staff because they're also all over the country, as you can see from the heat map, which I think is a, a really good visual of, of where our stations are and where we're getting out um, as well. But, uh, and lastly, I guess just a, another plea, if, if you do go out to any of the stations or visits or ride outs, et cetera, or EDs, just let us know, or there's a link where you can actually just put it on, um, on the MS forms, and then we can make sure that we're really clear on the heat map where that takes place. Thank you. Any questions or comments to all very straightforward? Probably we can move. No, okay, probably just move straight to what we're required to, required to do. So first of all, we just need to in, ensure that we have the board have ratified those two chair actions, one relating to capital spend, one relating to a negligence case. Everybody content with that? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, a couple of items to note, which we do need to do. Um, we note the non-compliance about the AGM minutes. We'll get that right this year. Fine. Still content with that item. Okay, in that case, we move to the section where we get feedback from our various committee members. Um, we'll go to Bethan first, because I know Bethan, you have to leave us, I think, fairly soon. But um, Bethan, can we come to you for feedback from the Quest Committee? Thank you, Chair. So we met as a Quest Committee on the 13th of August, and obviously members have a very detailed AAA report in front of them today. If I can just draw out a few key points, please. In the alert section, um, the picture is clear really, and we've talked about this a lot today. So the handover delays have continued and they continue to present safety risks to our patients, as we know. We had a clear picture presented on a deteriorating red performance. We had over 2,000 patients who waited more than 12 hours in our first quarter this year. And one patient waited over 50 hours, which is a staggering amount of time. We understand the reasons why. However, and on a positive, it was very evident to us that we continue to work with our partners to try to influence broader change across the system. And our focus for the first six months of this year has been to evolve our clinical model, which we very much understand to be key in terms of affecting change across the system. And we are confident we will see particular change affected in introducing and involving the clinical model for those patients who've fallen, 
often very old and frail individuals who are having to wait a very long time for our response. And we know that are added complications um, and harm caused as a result of that. Moving on to the advice section, I'd like to draw attention to paragraph three, which was our patient story. So we were delighted to hear from Linda, whose son Guy was in immense distress and pain as they waited for support. It's fair to say this wasn't the first time that we've heard from a family of somebody with complex needs and particularly a vulnerable adult with a learning disability. And one of the phrases that Linda shared with us really was um, very impactful for us. Linda said, not everyone fits into the same mould. And we absolutely understand that. What was clear was that we are continuing to engage with a range of learning disability groups across Wales in order to our respond, um, in order to improve our response model. But, but we also recognise the key change factor here would be our changing clinical model. And we will be able to identify more people with complex needs earlier on in their journey, which will have invaluable benefits for these individuals. Naturally, we thank Linda for her openness and courage to share hers and Gaia's story with us. Members also have a copy today of the Animal Safeguarding Report, which the committee was delighted to approve. It's attached to Annex A in these papers. We discussed the quality strategy implementation plan for 21 to 24. We noted the progress that has been made, but also we approved the extension of this plan to continue up until April 2025, as we continue to work on developing our strategy moving forward, our new quality plan for 25 to 28. We approved the management of medical devices policy and we bid farewell to two key um, colleagues, really, two individuals that have, significant, have had significant influence on Quest and all of its work. The first individual was Duncan Robertson, an assistant director who played a key role, certainly in progressing our approach to considering clinical indicators at the Quest committee in the last 12 to 18 months. And also to Kevin Davis, one of our non-exec directors who supported WASC for beyond the last eight years. Their contribution was very much recognized and they were thanked. Moving on then to the final section of the AAA report, the Assure section, we received the biannual update on the learning from deaths and mortality report. We discussed that and we recognised that there has been over a thousand referrals received from the medical examiner service and also responded to. We received the clinical audit, internal audit, and we were pleased to see there was a reasonable assurance provided and that management actions are in place. In the closed session, we received an update on the 111 CAS replacement project, and we were assured by the update that we received, especially given the pace that we had to develop this new project, and all those involved in this development were thanked and their input was recognised. And finally, just to mention risks, as we've discussed earlier on today, risks 223 and 224, and the impact of these ran throughout the whole agenda, as always. At that point, Chair, I'll pause and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Bethan. Any questions or comments to Bethan? I would just make the comment, if I may, Bethan, I think the safeguarding report was really interesting and a significant increase in the amount of safeguarding reports which we're now receiving, uh, which I think is really, really encouraging. Yes, we discussed that volume and that increase and we see that very much as a positive as individuals are becoming more confident and more aware of the, the key role they have to play really in protecting um, people across Wales. No, I think that's right. In, in another place where I, where I work in that social housing sector, we have a, a big programme of, of reinforcing the fact that even if somebody's going into a home to repair a tap, <clears throat> they, have a, they have a responsibility to have eyes open when they go into somebody's houses and you know, a lot of our but of our crews are some of the only people who will perhaps be going into people's homes where they, they can they can alert where necessary to, to safeguarding concerns. Yeah. Um, if I may, Chair, and uh, um, 
Beth, and just in terms of the report, the if I could just put a single bit of praise out to Fiona. So for me, Fiona McLean in our PECI team has been working incredibly hard with the UK Resuscitation Council and other colleagues in Wales. Uh, and there's a link in the AAA that takes you to a form now, which enables members of the public who have uh, undertaken CPR under our instruction and under our support in the community to then therefore report their experience and also to receive feedback and support if, if appropriate from us and from UK Resource Council. So <coughs> I think that's, we talk about patient stories, we talk about staff and volunteer experiences. This is a really good example where all of those things have come together and we've got we've now got a Welsh resource which is going to be made available across the UK to support people dealing with really tricky situations. Thank you, thank you, Liam. Any other questions or, or comments? So, so thank you very much, Stella. And, and just in terms of governance, just to remind people that you were looking, as you said in your paper, quite closely at those two, two harm risks, the 224 and I think the other number, but 223 and 224. And again, it's, it's good just to reflect the fact that, that the Quest is looking at those risks, particularly in terms of we're revising slightly our, our processes for the, um, the avoidance of, of harm consideration at board level. <coughs> reinforces the fact that this is looked at very closely in committee levels, not only yours, other committees as well, but there's a reference to the fact that your committee was looking at that, those risks and others, of course. So thank you very much, Bethan. Um, I think the next one, Kerry, is probably yours, is the charity feedback on the on the charity committee. Okay, uh, just a few updates. So um, really delighted that we've now appointed a head of charity. So this is part of our, our journey in terms of the strategic direction of the charity. So um, David is starting uh, in the next few weeks, I believe, on the 7th of October. 7th of October. Um, and I know Estelle is looking at a clear set of objectives. So then David will be looking at progressing the fundraising role because that's part of that whole timeline um, in the next six months. Um, Estelle has alluded to some work on the a new visual identity for the charity. Um, and there are more opportunities for us through the NHS Charities Together grants that we're looking at. Um, we had Jill Fleming came to committee to talk to us about her experience of bidding. Um, so she secured £11,000 for six Zen rooms in different locations. It's just really interesting to hear about her experience and also the lessons from those Zen rooms. And, you know, it's good that that is now linked up with Angie's team in, in terms of well-being. Um, I guess then just in terms of the finances, so the finances are looking healthy. We're tripping over, Chris, I think just over the 250K, which could impact around, do we need the independent examination? Um, but I think at the moment we're, we're still okay with the independent examination. There's, there's two thresholds and, yeah. um, and we're still un, under the one which doesn't allow us to trip over the other one. So we can, we've, we've confirmed with Audit Wales that we'll be able to do a, an independent examination rather than a full audit of the 23-24 charity accounts, which we'll come back to the cycle of governance next time. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which is assuring. And then the, the very <clears> final point is just around the risk. So we're progressing, you know, that risk framework for the charity. And by April next year, that um, will be complete. But just to give assurance that committee are cited on those risks in the meantime. Thank you very much, Kerry. Any questions, comments to Kerry? No. Good. OK, thank you. So we'll move on. In that case, the next one is the remuneration committee. Um, I don't have any particular to, to add to that. You've got some papers, I think, in front of you. So unless there's any questions, I'm prepared to move straight on to the next one. No questions or comments about remuneration committee? Okay. In that case, let's move on to the People and Culture Committee. And there are a number of approvals here. And I think Melvin's going to be joining us from Welsh language. Let's, uh, let's see if he uh, is joining us. We also have the AAA there for mm -hmm. Kerry. Do you want me to yes. quickly go please through? Yes, please do. The AAA? Yeah, that's so a good idea. We've already touched on a number of items that we've um, that we're updating in here. So um, I did want to mention the workforce race equality standards. So you know, I think organisationally we've recognised there's some challenges in terms of number of employees and also. Um, some of the um, employee relations 
um, and the investigations that, that are coming through here and the disproportionate numbers. But I know that Jason and Angie have recently had a meeting and we are, um, I think, just to give assurance here, going to be watching this closely, obviously through the strategic equality plan, but we recognise there's a challenge and, and I think the, the right focus is, is on it. Um, so the strategic plan, equality plan was endorsed um, and what we recognise, which is also linked to the, the race equality standards, is there's work to do in this area, so it's ensuring the right focus on that. Um, the gender pay gap report was endorsed. Um, there is still a gap there, and we know that's more at senior management level. We're focused on that. I won't talk about the Welsh language because obviously Melvin's going to be uh, talking to us shortly. Um, we had Kayleigh Wheeler join us, who's an operations manager um, for ambulance care. And actually, the committee were really complimentary about the transparency and openness. Um, that Kaylee was talking to us in terms of the challenges that she's faced. She's had quite a diverse background um, and, you know, is progressing on a leadership journey. But I think her feedback to us around um, what she's faced at worst around homophobia, misogyny and bullying, um, which has had a personal impact on her. But actually, the positive element of that is how she feels she's been listened to. And now she's very much part of the Voices Network and working with Angie on the team on leading some of the work. So she's really committed to amplifying the quieter voices in the organisation. So whilst there was some negative and, and quite hard to hear feedback from Kaylee, I think also there was lots of positive progress that... Um, that Kaylee was reporting to us and I think testament to her resilience and leadership and and she's really committed to being on that journey with us so um committee welcomed that we approved the um health and safety report um we did touch again on the um 2024 NHS staff survey so we know we've talked about it before that there are some challenges around the NHS staff survey um, in terms of timings and in terms of um, those engaged, but um, committee took assurance that we were focused on that. We had a partnership and engagement report from um, Estelle and talked about how we um, measured the, the more strategic engagement um, moving forward related to committee. Um, just have to call out Angie on um, being named as one of as one of the top 30 most influential HR practitioners in the UK. So uh, the committee commended Angie on, on that achievement. It's a fantastic achievement. And um, the committee recognised the significant amount of learning and development taking place at all levels across the trust. And I think we've talked about quite a lot of that context already today. Um, Committee received an update on the recruitment. So we've got Carl Neil Neeshaw uh, joining us the 1st of November. Um, and that Angie will then continue in the role of Director of People and Culture until that time. And then um, Angie will move to Director of, of Culture after that. So um, just in terms of assurance, um, we had a comprehensive look at the, the metrics um, in the MIQPR. And um, the, the highlights of that are in this report. Um, the cultural themes and trends paper, we looked at the managing attendance work programme. And whilst the target of 6% has not been achieved, and we've already touched on this earlier today, um, we were assured that there is a, a genuine decrease in the number of employees starting long -time term sickness. And I think there's some green shoots, Angie, that we talked about. Um, so downward trends, um, but we are going to have peaks and troughs. But, you know, that 6% continues to be a challenge for us. Um, so we had um, the internal <coughs> audit on disciplinary case management. 
um, which received uh, reasonable insurance, as did the volunteers' governance internal audit. And then just to touch on risk, um, the high absence rate. So again, um, and the reputational risk, which um, and maintaining effective and strong union partnerships, deterioration of staff health and well-being. So um, committee discussed these risks in detail and, and took assurance from that. So it's quite a long meeting chair, but um, there's lots more in the report. Well, very, really helpful. Thank you. And again, good to see the risks being identified there and evidence of good governance at work. Any questions or, or comments to, um, to Kerry in relation to that? We've got a number of um, uh, reports we have to approve, but shall we do the Welsh language one first if Melvin is with us? And I see he is. Melvin, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Welcome to you. And I will hand over to you. I believe you're going to be presenting the Welsh language um, annual report, which as a board we need to approve. Great. Thank you, Chair. Um, Dyma ein pimed a troddiad bynyddol a chyd yn ffurfio ar safonau Gymraeg a hoff yn dyn eich sylw at y meysydd canlynol. O ran ein cyniadau sefydraethu, mae grŵp cynghorio'r iaith yn bwydo i'r grŵp cynhwysiant, cydoddoldeb a camrywiaeth o ran cryfhau a luniad ar cynllun cydoddoldeb sythedol. O ran y hynaniaeth corfforaethol, derbynwyd caniatad gan swyddfa'r cabinet i symud i fathodyn y goron ddwyaethog. This is the fifth annual report on compliance with the Welsh language standards and would like to draw, bring your attention to the following areas. In terms of our governance arrangements, the Trust Welsh Language Advisory Group feeds into our EDI group as to strengthen alignments to the SEP. In terms of our corporate identity, permission was received from the Cabinet Office to move to a bilingual Crown Badge. The question and in covered at Galwata Cymraeg was an in 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 and the link double get can think with a bit session I got it there and can it double key at the very staff see that we bought it or come right I can get with a is the AI the article what I can write there have been improvements in a 111 service Welsh language calls answer rate following development of a Welsh language calls improvement plan Welsh language competence building sessions will be developed for staff who have knowledge of Welsh or would like to improve their Welsh language skills in answering Welsh language calls my canoli and Gosanet Kubiethi with the Kanadi in Kidam Furbet are Savonai, as a high in the Bunyad, a hostai or Demodia Darparo Kubiethi Athano. Centralizing our translation service has improved our efficiency in the translation of documents and reduced our reliance and costs in the use of external translation providers. A Berbud with Quinion can Eloter Kahoid and Linar Niber Vaur or Thuklai are with only a third Gueban in in in. Complaints were received from members of the public regarding the large number of articles on the 111 website A to Z encyclopedia that were not available in Welsh. A gever Dadek Pedor Dadek Pin, Bodon Guithredir IMTP, a gever Brudenin, Stepedon Cavluino, a Guithredi Policy Aith Newith, Sevetli Guelotin, Kidden Firvia, a Colonel Buincia, a Cohebiai, Ken Hurchi, a Cohoidi Dogbenai. Arwyddion a gwasanaethau derbyn feid. Ac yn olaf, fel rhan o'r cynllun gweithi strategol, bydd gwaith y mynd rhagddo i nodi lefelau sgiliau iaith staff gan nodi'r bylchau wrth darparu'r pynnig rhagweithiol i'n defnyddwyr gwasanaeth. For 24-25, we will seek to deliver the IMTP Year 1 action to introduce and implement a new Welsh language policy, implement a standards compliance baseline, will focus on correspondence, producing and publishing documents, signs and notices, and reception services. And finally, as part of our strategic workforce plan, work will progress in identifying the levels of Welsh language skills of our people and identify those skills gaps in delivering the active offer to our service users. And that concludes a summary of the report. Dear Melvin, that's about the limit of my French, of French, <laughs> well, <Welsh. laughs> Possibly a French too. <laughs> possibly French as well, yes. It's just the embarrassment of an Englishman trying to speak Welsh. You just feel so self-conscious, even with a, a single word, but uh, Dioch. Okay, any questions or comments to, um, to Melvin? 
I'll just make an observation, mm. please, Chair. Uh, just just Diok and Val to Mel Melvin um, uh, as our Welsh language manager and Kate Evans as our translator. I think that the, the, the focus now on Welsh language as a cultural change as opposed to Welsh language to for standards compliance is, is very different. And I think we're seeing that shift. Um, and that's that's I think going to be cemented when we have our Welsh language policy approved at People and Culture Committee, because so much education and training in comms will fall out of that. So I think it's an exciting journey ahead of us. Yeah, thank you, Matt Trish. Okay, yes, Hannah. I'm going to speak briefly in Welsh to Melvin, if that's okay. Um to Diolch and Barian Melvin am Radrodiad. Ring Gri Bobud, Raya Horani, Bride and Rusty, uh um my my yawn glow to come right in a birth. Um Rodnesha uh Govin, Beth Gatrani Grenade, Vel Burth, he help he get our um development <laughs> or uh or, or culture but then uh would Trish wedi um wedi dwees or sunny amdanum. I'm just uh, just asking Melvin um, in my slightly dodgy, rusty Welsh um, around what we might be able to do as a board to support the cultural change um, and also how nice it was to hear Welsh spoken um, during our board meeting. Thank you, Anna. Yes, I, I, I echo that as well. Beth, did you want to make any comments as a, as a fluent Welsh speaker? In um, English or Welsh? <laughs> Chair, to be honest, I just wanted to acknowledge the journey we've been on, which I know Trish has already made those comments, because I think um, the change is phenomenal. There's been so much progress. And previously, there was a group that I was involved in with Melvin and with other colleagues. And to see where we're at today and where we were two and a half years ago, there's a stark difference. And I think Trish is absolutely right to say that... Um, the introduction of a new Welsh language policy will, will provide the right sort of cornerstone almost for how we continue to develop and continue to move forward. I think Hannah's question about how we can, as non-execs and board members more broadly, support the, the cultural shift is, is an interesting one. Um, and as we know, culture is one of the hardest and slowest things to take forward. So, you know, that there's a lot... Um, it, it's not easy, I guess, is what I would say. But I would want to just go on record to thank Melvin because he's been unrelenting in his focus and his determination, really, to take us forward in the areas that we move in. Um, and his enthusiasm and energy never wavers, even when there's perhaps some um, challenges around him. So, Jacobaud Melvin, a song of a chad and ma would mahin and fantastic, really. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Beth. And Trish, you want to come Yeah, out? I was just going to say that there's a more than just words session, Hannah, uh, on board development in February. So Melvin has a, a hours hour slot. So that's part of part of the, the um, culture change and the more than just words action plan. So we'll get some some uh, prompts. And it's probably just worth just as an experience. I was looking around the room, you know, as, as we heard the report given in Welsh and then in English. It's worth remembering that in our bilingual country, our Welsh first language friends and colleagues, everything they hear is like that. Now, obviously they do understand English, but just, you know, if that felt a bit funny or a little bit sideways or a bit uncomfortable, we are, we are asking people to do that a lot of the time. And so it's probably just worth us reflecting on the difference it can make to hear something in your first language. It's a really, it's a really interesting comment, actually. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, yeah, useful thought. Use, useful thought. Okay, um, I think that's fine. The task before us is to uh, is to approve the World Language Annual Report. Just checking that we're all happy to do that. Okay, and I think probably we can thank you, Melvin, for attending and release you from duties. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. So the other task before us then is just to approve the other plans which are included in the PACs, which was the Strategic Equality Plan, the Gender Pay Gap um, Report, and the Workforce Equality Monitoring Report. We all content to approve those. They've all been um, taken to the appropriate committee in the first instance. So we can move on then to the Audit and Risk Committee, which is Peter, some feedback. Thanks, Chair. We met, I think, two weeks ago, just a couple of few items to bring 
to your attention. Firstly, we had three internal audit reports that did refer to the last year. So um, an issue that we've agreed for this year is that we shouldn't really be going on until September to get the, you know, the, the tail end of the previous year's reports. So an agreement you know, amongst um, staff and, and the internal auditors that the programme for this year will be finished by June 2025. We received three reports. Kerry has touched on two, the Volunteers Governance and Disciplinary Case Management, which had their due scrutiny at People and Culture. The final one, Risk Management, um, had a reasonable assurance, and I did the other two. And I'll come back to Risk Management at the end, because that was the substantive mm -hmm. item that we discussed. Um, other items, we, we received the QPMF um, framework, um, very encouraging in terms of our policy work to learn that we're now updating. I think 45% of policies are due to be completed this quarter, which you'll see in the report, we were down to 14% or something in the pandemic. So really encouraging to see that's been taken uh, seriously because that was picked up by Audit Wales in one of their structured assessments. Um, as always, we had a very good presentation from Carl Window about uh, um, local counter fraud service. It's always interesting to spot trends. You can see there are 37 recognised ongoing investigations. A lot are around staff having second jobs. Um, you mentioned, Chair, about the working from home. A, a risk or a danger is when staff become invisible, there's the temptation to take on a second job without telling us. And it's in terms of the um, prevalence, it's not that great. However, it is happening, but it was reassuring to hear that Carl and, and the team are, are, are onto it. And um, Jason, I know you raised the interesting point about the threshold of reporting. I mean, that's that's a management issue. I'm sure you're going to take yeah. that on. But, you know, when you see these numbers, you kind of think, think well, how many could be nipped in the bud? How many should be um, taken forward and so on? But it was really good to hear that, that you're going to look at that in yeah. terms of the, the, the threshold of reporting. Uh, another positive was the audit tracker. We're making very, very good progress. This might not be the most interesting of areas, but it's really important that audit recommendations are followed up. Um, and instead, I, I attended a chairs of audit committee meetings with the health boards, and there's no doubt that we're ahead of the game on this. I know that, that Alex has, has done some really good work, as have all staff, really. It's been taken seriously, and clearly some of the, you know, it's a challenge elsewhere in, 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 in the health board. So to see this being taken seriously, there are a few that have, on their third date, that there will be. Uh, but we did, I think, apply the, the the correct scrutiny and assurance over the reasons for the extension request and so on. Um, and I, I'll finish off by, by um, talking of risk management. It was, we, we gave a fair bit of the agenda to Trish and Julie, who gave a really good presentation on the journey of our risk transformation program. We've already alluded to it earlier on in the agenda, but four key themes, one, developing the strategic BAF and to really align these strategic objectives to our strategic risks is a fantastic development. Secondly, risk appetite, which we as a board, I think are gonna have, are gonna hear a lot more about. I think it's really important that we, we assess that. And I think Trish, come February, we'll have a dedicated session at board to really look at what does it mean for us and let's set the proper parameters for, for, for risk appetite. The third leg was the repositioning of 223 and 224, which we talked about. And then 43, grateful for, for Johnny's support in terms of the, the, the digital support, because those platforms are going to be really, really important. Uh, the current system, I think it's fair to say, does not meet our purposes. So it's essential with, with Johnny's help that we build an appropriate digital platform. Without that, it's difficult to move the program on. So we were really, really pleased with that presentation. We are on a journey. And board will will hear more about that in particular the, the risk appetite in february that's selfish mm -hmm. there chair Have lovely okay yeah thank you thank you very much peter risk appetite is always an interesting topic isn't it that understand it's a sort of an evolution from earlier risk, risk risk management models okay um any other questions comments to peter no excellent thank you very much so we move on then to finance and performance uh, which is Peter again? I'll take it um, <laughs> for the one and only time because in future, Jane, well, don't count on Jane will be <laughs> so, This is my one chance to um, you know, to talk about it. Uh, we we met last week. Uh, in, 
very good meeting, covered an awful lot of areas, a lot of which you know we, we, we've already covered today. Um, there is one area to alert to the board, which you can see in the AAA report, and that relates to some of the missing data, the missing KPIs. And I think, Rachel, you've already covered the, the reasons for that earlier on. But I know that is something, the 111, the advanced, the, the APPs and other quality indicators, it's not that they're not in, that they've been forgotten about, but I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but they're in progress, they're, they're, they're being assessed and they will be produced next time around. Yeah, in due course, some of them may take a bit longer than others, but yeah. That was the only um, alert. I mean, other areas, like I said, that we've covered today, the MIQPR, uh, the MI, IMTP, uh, and the EMS were, were considered, uh, and we did a fair bit of scrutiny. Areas to, to, to pull out, we had a really good presentation from Lee on the Charu, and I think we've seen nods around the table. For those of us who don't come from this background, it was really enlightening to, to, to hear that explained, the really good work that's going on there. So. So thanks to Lee for that. Thanks also to Johnny for the, for the metrics. The, the digital metrics is one area that needs to be developed. We know that. So it's really good to hear your plans, Johnny, and, and, and how we'll um, do that in the future. And then finally, the, the, looking at Chris's area, we had quite a lot about um, decarbonisation, estates maintenance, and, and waste management. That They don't often take the the pride of place in 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 reporting but i think what what i took assurance from is in terms of our estate we're doing an awful lot of good work firstly in terms of reducing the backlog maintenance and it was really encouraging to hear that none of our estate correct me if i'm wrong are in the significant or, or the top two categories that really need attention which i think is this small element that we significantly improved in those areas and, and and seen significant reductions in the, yeah. the level of backlog maintenance in those areas, um, which basically evidences that we're, we're targeting the, the investment that we're able to make in the right places. Yeah. I think that was the, insur the assurance we've got. <laughs> Similarly, our waste management and our decarb, I know we had a limited assurance audit, which was largely around the lack of availability of funding to do the things. What we were pressing for was the things that we can control, we are doing. So it was really encouraging. Again, I think we're on a journey, but to hear, hear the spread of the, of, of the importance of that across all our estate was really, really helpful, as was the waste management as well. I think that's it, Chair. Okay. Again, happy to take any questions. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed, Peter, um, on behalf of the FNP. So any comments, questions on that? Thank you very much. Okay, in that case, let, let us move on. We're getting on to the awards, the closing items. Um, reflections and summary of today's meetings. Any reflections that anybody wishes to, to make? Any thoughts about today's meetings? We've covered a, a wide range of matters. It seems to have been a very detailed meeting, I think, today. Can I just make one reflection on some of the AAAs? So, so particularly the people in culture um, and finance and performance ones and Quest actually were quite long um, and they are a summary report. But I think it was important that the areas that um, we spend a lot of time on in those meetings that don't necessarily come here are important to draw out with a bit more particularity yeah. so that those members, that those people around this table that aren't in those meetings actually get that level of assurance that we we are looking under the hood of those things that might not necessarily come here. So sometimes they will be larger and a bit more akin to minutes, I guess. But um, I, I think it it just shows how much we were getting through in those meetings. No, I agree. I completely agree with that. And I think that the reference to the risks is also good for governance purposes as well to demonstrate that there is that very clear audit trail that the these various committees are looking at the risks in detail and it identifies which risks sit within which committees, which is a, a very good governance process. Liam. Yeah, just as Trish said that, I think it's the link back to the first conversation we had on the chief executive. The journey is a complete journey, isn't it? So, and I, and I kind of say that from a policy and safety perspective, because we all know what the experience is for many people using our services. And it's important that they are assured that we are viewing it through every possible lens and looking for every bit of improvement possible. So when we take the paper that Jason presents, that's almost like the headlines of where we're at. And underneath that, Underneath the bonnet is the work that Rachel's leading on, which is the MIQPR, which is pulling all of this into one place, which is a complex and dense document, no matter how hard we try, uh, for people to access. And then the AAA, I hope, I would, we all work with our respective NEDs 
to make sure it, it feels alive and it comes to life in there. So um, I would just take us back to that first conversation and the journey that this completes. Good, okay, thank you, Nagri. Okay, in that case, we move on. Uh, we don't have any other business I'm aware of other than to just make reference to the fact that this is Kevin's, or would have been Kevin's last board meeting had he been here. Um, <laughs> We can't therefore uh, thank him again. We have already thanked him, of course, but we, we can't thank him in person today. But I think the minute should record the fact that, that we do owe Kevin a, a significant debt of gratitude for the length of service. It's gone well beyond the eight years, as everybody knows, because of various extensions that were granted because of our uh, sort of hiccups in terms of recruitment, the length of time it took us to recruit his successor as vice chair, and then subsequently other, other non-exec positions. So, we, uh, we, in his absence, give, give that uh, recognition of uh, grateful thanks to Kevin for the service which he has uh, that he has given us over. I think what nine years, probably more than nine, nine years, nine and, nine and a half years. So it's a long time, uh, and we miss him. Okay, date of next meeting will be the 29th of November. So all that remains is that we just need to resolve now to exclude uh, the press and members of the public, so that we can reconvene after a lunch break in a closed session for the small number of items that need to be dealt with in a. Um, confidential manner. So we'll close the meeting there and uh, we are planning to reconvene at 10 past one. I wonder whether we might make it one o'clock. So if everyone's happy, we'll, we'll reconvene at one o'clock for the closed session, giving us just over half an hour for a lunch break. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much.